esto? Uh, welcome to principal, sir. Uh, very good morning to all of you. Oh. Amaya, now we can start. Uh, are you ready for Kushi for it is YouTube live? Yes, sir. Okay, now. Let's start. Please this... start. Yes, sir. Let's start this bright morning with this superb scene. Welcome every morning with a smile. Look on a new day as a, another special gift from your creator. Another golden opportunity to complete what you were unable to finish yesterday. Be a self-starter. Let your first star set the theme of success and positive action that is certain to echo through your entire day. Today will never happen again. Don't waste it with a false start or a no start at all. You are not born to fail. Very good morning to one and all present here. I am Amaya Divati, Secretary of Mathematics Club, PCE. First of all, I want to thank you all for taking out time from your busy schedule and adding glory to this inauguration ceremony. Thank you so much for joining in today. As we all know why we are gathered here, of course, we are having something very informative and knowledgeable in hand. Today we are presenting national webinar on prerequisites for execution of research work, which is presented by the Research and Development Cell of PCE in collaboration with Mathematics Club PCE. I am blessed to welcome all the dignitaries, Honorable Chief Guest Dr. Yankata Kishnayan Sindagasso, former Additional Director, GTRE, Emeritus Scientist, DRDO, Guest of Honor, Dr. J.P. Modak, sir, Ex-Dean Academic Affairs, VNIT, Nagpur, Ex-Dean R&D, LTJSS, and Advisor Technical, JD College of Engineering and Management, Nagpur. I am pleased to welcome the Advisory Committee, Dr. P.B. Maheshwari, sir, Dean Science and Technology, RTMNU, Nagpur. Dr. Rakesh Srivastava, sir, chairman, the Institu Institution of Engineers, Nagpur, professional consultant and trainer. Dr. S.R. Pimple, sir, ex-general manager, Ashok Leland, Bhandara. Dr. G.D. Kedar, sir, HOD Mathematics, RTMNU, Nagpur. Dr. S.B. Jazu, sir, dean, R&D, GHRCE, Nagpur. Dr. V.M. Nanuti, sir, principal PIT, Nagpur. 
डॉक्टर आर एम ढोबले सर डीन एंड आर एन डी टी सी नागपुर डॉक्टर सी सी हांडा सर एच ओ डी मेकॅनिकल इंजिनिअरिंग डिपार्टमेंट के डी के नागपूर दे हॅव मेंटर अस अ लॉट फॉर दिस वेबिना अँड वी आर व्हेरी थँकफुल टू दॅम फॉर दिस आय एम एस्टॉनिश टू वेलकम ऑनरेबल प्रिन्सिपल डॉक्टर एम पी सिंग सर वाईस प्रिन्सिपल डॉक्टर एस ए ढाले सर डॉक्टर मिसेस ए ए कुलकर्णी मॅम एच ओ डी अप्लाईड मॅथमॅटिक्स पी सी कन्व्हेनर डॉक्टर गिरीश मेहता सर को डीन ऑफ रिसर्च अँड डेव्हलपमेंट सेल पी सी कन्व्हेनर प्रोफेसर सतीश तिवारी सर इन चार्ज ऑफ मॅथमॅटिक्स क्लब पी सी ई को कन्व्हेनर प्रोफेसर प्रवीण जाधव सर सेक्रेटरी डॉक्टर सुभाष वाघमारे सर प्रोफेसर मनीषा पुन मॅम प्रोफेसर स्वीटी रोकडे मॅम अँड प्रोफेसर कृणाल मुदाफले सर I also welcome the organizing committee deans and authorities of various departments and invited faculties research scholars industry persons and all the students adding over i welcome abvp social media in charge gujarat technical university mr sarthak pandya sir we are very delighted to have you all in the now inauguration ceremony of national webinar on prerequisite for execution of research work To start with the inauguration ceremony I would first like to offer a virtual floral welcome to all the dignitaries I request you all to accept our floral virtual bouquet Thank you everyone As we have often heard light is a symbol of brightness and prosperity as sunlight expels the darkness of night similarly blessings bring in our life prosperity and happiness to make this be blessed one invokes god as saraswati by lighting the lamp of knowledge and wisdom please light the lamp shruti <laughs> Now I request Professor Satish Tiwari sir convener of our webinar and in charge of mathematics club PC to brief about mathematics club over to you sir uh, very thank you amaya a very good morning to all and welcome you all for the inaugural ceremony of 3 days national webinar on prerequisite of execution of research work which is to be held from 20th october to 30th october 2021 this webinar was organized by research and development cell pc in association with the mathematics club of pc nagpur honorable chief guest of today's function dr venkata krishnaiya thandaga sir former additional director gtre emeritus scientist drdo honorable guest of honor of today's function dr jp modak ex dean academics vnit nagpur and ex dean rnd ltjss advisor technical jd college of engineering and management nagpur respected principal sir dr mp singh respected vice principal dr s a dhale respected hod applied mathematics dr a a kulkarni respected dynamic convener dr g d mehta all dignitaries deans hods faculty members research scholars industry persons students and the whole organizing committee of this webinar i welcome you all on behalf of priyadarshini college of engineering nagpur i want to brief about the maths club the mathematics club of pc is a club initiated to help the engineering students for the preparation of campus recruitment gate preparation and other competitive examination by conducting national level quizzes on maths and aptitude in addition to this the club conducts various useful webinars workshop with a prominent resource person 
to provide exposure to our student to grow academically as well so this is the motto of the maths club now i thank you all for this patience listening and once again welcome you all for this national webinar on research methodology thank you over to amaya thank you sir for your constant support and valuable guidance now i would like to invite dr girish mehta sir convener of our webinar and co dean of research and development cell pce to give a brief introduction mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. please sir over to you mehta sir yeah yeah just just a minute a very bright morning to all i welcome all the dignitaries for today's national webinar on prerequisite for execution of research work i welcome honorable chief guest for today's function dr vishnu venkatakrishnaiya thandaga sir the former additional director gtre emeritus scientist drdo i also welcome honorable guest of honor for today's function dr jp modak ex dean academics affair vnit nagpur ex dean r and d at tjss and advisor technical jd college of engineering nagpur i also welcome the advisory committee for this organizing this uh, research workshop that is uh, professor maheshwari dean uh, science and technology rtmn shri sr pimple ex general manager uh, ashok land uh, dr r s shivastava chairman institute of engineers uh, dr uh, gd kedar hod mathematics department of rashtrakuta tukloji maharaj nagpur university dr s b jaju dean r and d raisoni college dr c c handa hod mechanical kedke college and dr a a kulkarni hod maths dr s a dhale vice principal pc dr dobre dean r and d uh, nagpur i also uh, welcome chairperson of today's function a respected principal uh, dr mp singh sir i also welcome all deans hods of priyadarshini college of engineering my colleague and very dynamic uh, professor satish tiwari convener and in charge of this uh, workshop uh, a very innovative person my colleague professor pravin jadhav to convener secretaries and my colleagues dr subhash wagmare professor manisha pun professor sweety rokre professor kunal mudav and mathematics club i welcome all dear my participants industrial persons and students the objective of this workshop is to provide platform to research scholar and student to learn about how to identify the research proposals method of execution and the interpretations of results outcome the obtained research outcome must be presented in front of the world and what is the procedure to present in front of the world that is known as the research paper and one of the prominent and important thing that whatever we are doing the research that should be utilized for the society these all aspect would be covered in this workshop i hope you will enjoy the field day journey of this research thank you very much thank you sir we are very excited to explore what unfolds in the upcoming session a leader lights the path to the impossible and takes those who follow to the great height it is an injustice to proceed to the event without calling upon our wings of flight our pillar of strength and our constant source of motivation i invite the principal of pc dr mp singh sir to address the audience over to you sir thank you amaya a uh, very good morning to one and all present here and warm welcome to all of you in today function a three days national level workshop prerequisite for the execution of research work organized by research and development cell of pc in association with mathematics club of pc hope you all are safe and taking good care of yourself today chief guest dr venkata krishnaiya tandaga former additional director gtre emeritus scientist drdo guest of honor dr jp modak ex dean affairs vnit nagpur ex dean rnd ltss advisor technical jd college of engineering dr acid hale vice principal of the institute dr vm nanoti principal pit dr r dobre dean rnd dr gd mehta co dean rnd and convener of this program 
प्रोफेसर सतीश तिवारी कन्वीनर एंड फैकल्टी इन चार्ज ऑफ मैथमेटिक्स क्लब पीसी प्रोफेसर प्रवीण जाधव को कन्वीनर डॉक्टर कुलकर्णी हेड मेकन मैथमेटिक्स डिपार्टमेंट डीन्स प्रोफेसर्स हेड्स ऑफ डिपार्टमेंट्स ऑफिस बेरस इंटायर रेस्पेक्टेड स्टाफ ऑफ प्रिजर्सनी कॉलेज ऑफ इंजीनियरिंग एंड माई वंडरफुल डियर पार्टिसिपेंट आई वेलकम यू ऑल इन दिस इनॉग्रल फंक्शन ऑफ थ्री डेज वर्कशॉप विच इज गोइंग टू बी इंगेज यू फॉर थ्री डेज टू अंडरस्टैंड द रिसर्च एंड द हाउ रिसर्च कैन बी एग्जीक्यूटेड I take this opportunity to just brief about our college. Pradeshni College of Engineering is a flagship institute of very renowned group that is Lokman Tilak Jan Kalyan Shikshan Sanstha Nagpur. Honorable Sri Satish Chaturvedi ji is the chairman of this sanstha. Honorable Mrs. Abha Chaturvedi madam is the secretary of this sanstha. Sri Dusyant Chaturvedi ji is director governing board. Sital Chaturvedi madam is a member of the board and our dynamic lead director sri avijit deshmukh is looking after all the equity of the institution pc established in 1990 is a unique institute having more than 32 years of rich experience in creating what in bithas it is among very few institute in india which is given a plus status by naik for its quality education and state of art infrastructure we offer undergraduate programs pg programs as well as phd programs and maximum programs which are eligible are accredited by national board of accreditation once twice or thrice we conferred a grade by government of maharashtra for academic excellence we are also accredited by tcs for campus placement we are have also having the status ugc 2f and 12b and we are also placed in platinum category in aict cii survey 2019 the culture of research and development is our major strength which brought us many laurels in terms of patents paper publications sponsored project consultancy the institute provides all conducive and cooperative eminence for the teachers as well as facilitator to achieve milestone in academic research and extension activities i here i like to mention today our one speaker is dr jp modak it is the creation of his environment in pc who has spent more than 13 to 14 years under him more than 50 60 students have uh, done their phd and maximum people of in this region has taken the guidance of him i am also also happy to know the organizers are going to have the very good topics they are going to cover it fundamental prerequisition for the execution research on the part of an institute on the part of guide and on the part of research scholar which is going to be covered by dr jp modak then foundation of research advance in research areas in gas turbines and technology and this few days i hope at the end of this session you all should be able to understand what is the research and how it can be processed i congratulate dr gd mehta and his team who has come forward dr tiwari professor tiwari who has taken lead and running the mathematics club since last one years and has created the technical knowledge among the students about the mathematics i wish all the best to all of you many many thanks to one and all thank you very much thank you so much sir we are so honored and privileged to have you among us as a team leader now i invite the guest of honor dr jp modak sir ex dean academic affairs vnit nagpur ex dean rnd ltgss and advisor technical jd college of engineering and management to speak on today's special occasion over to you sir good morning everybody attending this function uh my dear chief guest of this function dr venkatayya the principal of vidyashree college of engineering Dr. M. P. Singh, the other principals now of the same system, that is Dr. Vivek Manoti, Dr. Dhobe, Professor Dhale, the vice principal of P. S. Shri College of Engineering, other faculty members of P. S. Shri College of Engineering, other eminent persons attending this function, my dear students. at the outset i express my deep sense of thanks and gratitude 
to the organizers of this function of having invited me to play a role in the inaugural function as well as to make a presentation in the context of this theme of prerequisites of research. I must mention here that this theme of prerequisites of research, which has struck to the organizers of this function, is very marvelous and it is very important theme and for which the Institute gets the credit of having struck this idea to this Institute for the first time perhaps in India. Secondly, talking about this prerequisites of research, the very briefly, I would like to mention that there are some three, four requirements towards this. The very first is to have the complete knowledge of the research process, starting from identification of issue which is to be executed, that is what research should be executed. That should be decided first and for that, the faculty members of the institute or the cell has to have the capability. This is gained by the involved human resource to a great extent during their training for doctoral research and also during their training as a supervisor of the research. Second issue, most important, is organizing the physical facilities. The physical facilities can be organized partly by the institute itself where the research is being conducted, partly maybe in collaboration with other sister and friend institutes. Obstacle comes when some enough research facility is not adequately organized how to raise the funding. Even for the funding, there are ways out and I'm going to highlight this issue in details in my lecture. Regarding funding, I would like to make one indication here and that is, for example, if very big organization asks for funding from very big funding agencies of India, like Department of Science and Technology and other similar organizations, funding becomes very easy for IITs, for Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, Nowadays, even from national institutes, even for the universities, we are registered as government universities. But it is very difficult, rather fairly difficult, for private organizations and private institutions to organize the funding. Still, there are good ways out in order to get the solution to this problem. In my detailed talk, which is going to follow after this inaugural function, I'm going to have a focus on this. Before I close, I express once again my thanks and gratitude to organizers of this function for having invited me to play a role in this function. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, sir, for directing our delegate and letting us know about the research and development. I'm sure everyone is overwhelmed by your words. Moving ahead, I call Chief Guest Dr. Vyankata Krishnaya Sundara Sir, former additional director, DPRE, American scientist, DRDO, to invite me to Please, sir. <coughs> Am I audible? Hello? Yes, sir. You are yes, audible. Sir. Ah, yes. yes sir. Very good morning to all the dignitaries, respected dignitaries on the dais, as well as off the dais, and especially the principal, the chairman. Dr. M. P. Singh and the convener, co-dean of uh, R&D work, Girish D. Mehtaji, and then Professor Satish Tiwari, who is also handling the mathematics club. Now, the um, important two components of this uh, webinar or the, uh, the national conference on uh, the prerequisite for execution of the research work. The two components are the executor, so you may be research uh, fellow, research scientist, or call him research worker. So he has to have two qualities, attributes. One is he must have the passion to do the research work. 
I want to do some other thing. You should not have that. So the passion to do the research work comes with the, the executor or the research person. The second component, second uh, quality you should have is a motivation to do the research work. The motivation can be self-motivation or the mentor has to create the motivation to do the research work. That is a part of the executor or the research worker. The first portion of uh, the webinar or the conference is about the execution. So the first component is over. In fact, to elucidate that, Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan, who is a teacher, once he was in Mysore, he had come uh, for inauguration in the PG center. Somebody asked him a question, how, how do we define a good teacher? He said, a good teacher not only teaches, but creates interest in the subject. For example, especially in mathematics, in high school level, if you keep on telling, so simultaneous equation, that equation, this equation, students will feel it very difficult. Unless you create uh, the interest in the mathematics, they find they love the subject. So, in the case of research, the motivation for the research worker or the research fellow comes by himself or from the mentor. So, the mentor plays a very important role in the execution of this research work through the research worker. The next point in that, next component in that, is the research work itself. As Mamatek uh, Sahib has mentioned, you should have a very good domain knowledge on the subject, what you are going to take up, the domain knowledge on the subject of the research. If that is not there, it's very difficult to carry out. For example, if I'm expert in history, if you ask me to do a uh, research in geography, it's just difficult for me. That our vice versa also. So the person who is executing the work of the research work must be terribly familiar with the subject. Example, I'll give an example. I just asked a gentleman, I have an axial flow turbine, I have efficiency 85%. Can you improve to be 87 or 88? Whatever we can do. So then you should have a domain knowledge of fluid mechanics, gas dynamics, aerodynamics, and uh, numerical mathematics, etc. So unless he has the domain knowledge, he cannot attack this problem at all. So he finds it very difficult, even it will be difficult for the mentor or the guide also. So the second component, as I mentioned, the research work is the domain knowledge of the problem, what one has taken, Montex have mentioned that also. So these are the two prerequisites on the part of number one, the research worker or research scientist, number two, on the part of the research work itself. If these two components are satisfied, then you find a very easy execution of the project, that is research work. So with these two um, points, which I would like to mention, and secondly, also what I said, necessity is the mother of invention. So if you want to invent, nowadays necessity is a mother of innovation. For example, as I mentioned, if you want to improve something which is already existing, supposing I have a washing machine, it takes more, more time or more power, I want to reduce it. So you work on that more, both experimentally and theoretically or uh, whatever way you do it to improve upon that. That is innovation. So the necessity is the mother of this innovation. So it has to be useful to the society, the research work. That ultimately, research work has to be utilized for the common man. Example, I'll give a very example now. Uh, some of the, of course, there is a feeling, some people, uh, research work, it, uh, it is a, it's not a time bomb like MTech or PhD or what. It takes its own time. Cost explication will be there. Then time explication will be there. The person who is funding it may bang us. These kinds of, uh, these kind of problems may arise. It is not uh, new to any research work. But to consider, for example, COVID-19. 90, uh, 90, what happened? Suddenly, there, there was a spring uh, of action and we could get coaxin, cold shield within a very short interval of time. Research work was done. Some chemicals were added, virus was taken, adding, subtracting, filtration, whatever it is, they did it and they come out with the medicine for the society. There's also a kind of research work. Some of the research work has to be done very fast. Some of them may take time. But one more important thing is the research worker should have a very good domain knowledge 
on the subject, what he is handling it. If that is taken care of, we can easily say that these two are the prerequisites for the execution research work, and we will have terrible success in the research work. With these two uh, items in my mind, I would like to thank all the persons who are attending here, listening to me, and also I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak on this occasion of uh, the inauguration of this wonderful uh, research and development project work, um, a workshop as a prerequisite, which has two components of execution authority, what is this responsibility, and what is research work, how do we define, how do we go about it, and uh, I'm sure in these three days, there'll be a lot of deliberation on the subject. There'll be a lot of understanding of the subject. There'll be a lot of uh, uh, exchange of ideas from uh, eminent persons who are going to speak on this uh, subject for, for the, in the three, four day, three days. And once again, I thank organizers and Mehtaji for giving them an opportunity to be here amongst all of you, eminent persons. Uh, on the occasion of the inauguration of this uh, webinar or the national workshop on the prerequisite for the execution of the research work. Thank you all once again. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your precious words. I am sure a lot of aspiring researchers got inspired by your words. We rarely get the opportunity to listen to the words of a great person. Moving ahead. It's often said that gratitude opens the door to the power, to the wisdom, to the creativity of the universe. Henceforth, I call Ms. Soumya, President of Mathematics Club, to deliver the vote of thanks. Greetings to all of you, respected ladies and gentlemen. As we come close to the inaugural ceremony, of the national level workshop on prerequisite of execution of research work on behalf of Mathematics Club of PC Nagpur in association with Research and Development Cell of PC, it's my privilege to propose the vote of thanks and acknowledge the contribution of all those who worked really hard. So beginning with the glory to the almighty God for making today's occasion of the inaugural ceremony of the workshop a resounding success. I devote my leading thank to the patrons to giving us opportunity to stage such events. First and foremost, I thank our honorable chief guest, Dr. Venkata Krishnaya Thandaga Sir, former additional director of GTRE and emeritus scientist at DRDO, who despite his hectic schedule has graced this occasion. We are overwhelmed to have you with us, sir. Now, I express my deep gratitude to respected guest of honor, Dr. J.P. Modak, sir, an advisor technical of Cheney College of Engineering, Nagpur. It was extremely kind of you, sir, for accepting our invitation and being a part of this auspicious occasion. I'm tremendously filled with gratitude to our advisory committee, Dr. P. B. Maheshwari, sir, Dean of Science and Technology at RTMNU, Nagpur, Dr. Rakesh Shrivastava, sir, chairman of the Institution of Engineering, Nagpur. Dr. S. R. Pimpali, sir, ex-general manager at Ashok Leyland, Bhandara. Dr. G. B. Kedar, sir, head of the Department of Mathematics in RTMNU, Nagpur. Dr. S. B. Jaju, sir, Dean of Research and Development at GHRCE Nagpur, Dr. V. M. Nanoti, Sir, Principal of PIET Nagpur, Dr. C. C. Handa, Sir, Head of the Department of Mechanical Engineering at KDK Nagpur, Dr. R. M. Doble, Sir, Dean of Research and Development at PCE Nagpur, 
for their superficial suggestions and the contributions. I thank our majestic Dr. M. P. Singh Sir, Principal of PCE Nagpur, for his stewardship, support, vision, and commitment for this workshop. My heartfelt thanks to our well wisher, Dr. S. A. Dhali Sir. Vice Principal of PCE Nagpur for his advices and encouragement to the event. I thank Dr. A. A. Kulkarni Ma'am, Head of the Department of Applied Mathematics, PCE, for her unstinted support for this event. We are specially obliged to the convener of the workshop, Dr. Girish Mehta Sir, co-dean of research and development cell of PCE and to the convener, Professor Satish Tiwari Sir, teacher in charge of the mathematics club of PCE, who had highlighted the directions for this workshop and has constantly tutored and leaded us. I present our special thank to the co-convener of the workshop Professor Praveen Jadav Sir for his consistent support and presence. I acknowledge the secretaries of the workshop, Dr. Subhash Vagmani Sir, Professor Kronal Mudafli Sir, Professor Manisha Pund Ma'am, and Professor Sweeti Rokri Ma'am for arranging resources and channelizing the workshop. I share my exceptional indebtedness to our organizing committee for beholding us. I dedicate an excessive appreciation to our student coordinator committee for serving to the proper functioning of this workshop. Further, I thank all the distinguished invitees present here, accepting our invitation and all the deans HODs of the various departments, faculties, research scholars, industry persons, and all the driving committee of students and participants for their cooperation and presence. Finally, I leave you all with this quote by John Kennedy. We must find time to stop and thank the people who made a difference in our lives. Once again, thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ms. Samya, for your special words. Now, I request everyone to turn on their cameras for photographs so that we can capture this great day in our memory. Please. All are requested to please turn on their camera for this photograph. Thank you all. Moving further, let me quickly introduce you all to the agenda of today's event. We will be conducting sessions of an hour with all of our guest speakers with the question and answer round at the end of each session. Today we are having three resource persons with us. The first lecture is of Dr. J.P. Modak, sir. He is going to make us understand the fundamental prerequisite for executing research on the part of an institute, on the part of guide, and on the part of research scholar. The second lecture is of Dr. R. S. Srivastava, sir. He is going to guide us about the foundation of research. The third lecture is of Dr. Vyankata Krishnaya Khandaga, sir. He is going to deliver a lecture about the advances and research areas in gas turbine technology. I hope you 
all of you stay tuned till the end and get drenched in the sea of learning creativity and critical thinking are of particular importance in scientific research research is an original investigation undertaken to gain knowledge and understand concepts in major subject areas of specialization and includes the generation of ideas and information leading to a new or substantial improved scientific insight with relevance to the needs of the society since the primary object of the research is to produce new knowledge to enlighten us more regarding this topic i welcome respected resource person dr jp modak sir ex dean academic affairs vnit nagpur ex dean rnd ltj assist and advisor technical jd college of engineering and management nagpur he is a phd in nitro electrodynamic analysis and synthesis of mechanisms he has published around 650 research papers which include various international journals of high repute he has accomplished around 25 industry oriented sponsored research projects and consultancy assignments he has been awarded the best research paper award thrice nationally i appeal you sir to enlighten us regarding the topic fundamental prerequisite for executing research on the part of an institute on the part of the guide and on the part of the research scholar over to you please sir Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you're audible. Good morning to all. dignitaries who are attending this presentation uh my presentation is exclusively on in the context of how to generate the required finance particularly in the context of the self financing institutions or any research assignment next, next slide organizing finance here my proposal is a very big research project one should have a detailed planning about this and break down the total big research project into two three stages and assign one stage every year to undergraduate students because in undergraduate the students are required to execute their project and the finance they are required to organize themselves so this aspect the uh, administrators of wealth organizing institution should should keep in mind while organizing finance for their own activities of research in undergraduate project students organize funding themselves what is the concept of breaking down a big project in two three stages for this i am considering an example of hpfm energize rotary forging press i would like to explain what is the abbreviation hpfm stands for hpfm is in fact similar to electric motor only thing is in electric motor the first energy is electrical energy that is converting converted into rotational kinetic energy here in hpfm Finally, we get rotational kinetic energy of applied will, but original original energy is human power. So, Pedler is first major subsystem in HPFM. The second one is conversion of limbs of more human being into rotation. Third is increasing the magnitude of this rotation, first generated by human being by special speed increasing mechanisms and finally a storage device a flywheel this comprises these four subsystems they comprise human power flywheel motor i'll be coming to the schematic drawing of the system in the next slide 
just to complete the complete energy system with this as energy source it needs two additional systems one is mentioned here in the next block stfc an abbreviation which stands for torsionally flexible clutch which is necessary for smooth transmission of momentum from the flywheel to the input shaft of the process unit of the process unit which is being investigated in at every time in this case the process unit is rotary forging press details of hpfm the schematics shown in the slide it represents the human power flywheel motor on the right right extreme i have shown pedals p1 p2 similar to bicycle drive s it stands for the bicycle seat ch that stands for chain drive bcs is a big chain sprocket whose axle is the same as the axle of pedals p1 p2 an axle of small chain sprocket which is conventionally we find in bicycle drive is a rear axle then this rotatory motion of small chain sprocket is required to be amplified by appropriate most positive is a flywheel which is a fairly big in size about 1 meter rim diameter 10 cm rim width 2 cm rim thickness 6 arm flywheel followed by that it is in this flywheel that the human energy of the pedler will be stored in view of this size of the flywheel in about 1 minutes time of a pedler about 3000 to 4000 kg force meter of energy is stored the pedler is uniquely in the age group of 18 to 25 years good anthropometric ability that is good body organs <clears throat> in 1 minute when 3000 to 4000 kg force meter of energy is stored in this flywheel then pedaling is stopped and this flywheel is connected to a process unit which is represented here by a block p which is the process unit in between the flywheel and the process unit there are two devices one is tagp abbreviation tagp stands for torsional that is torque amplification gear pair there will be one gear pair which will amplify the torque which is delivered by the flywheel at flywheel shaft to the input shaft to the process unit followed by that that is torsionally flexible clutch that is a special type of clutch which is developed during evolving this investigation which is about very slow momentum transfer from the high speed spinning flywheel to the input shaft to the process unit the limb movement is converted into rotation that is the first sub system of this energy source and for that the conventional bicycle drive is such that not in exactly 180 degrees of rotation of the big sprocket but slightly less than that that we get the rotation at the half rotation or other one rotation at a rear sprocket this about 15 to 30 degrees of rotation which is lost in conventional drive that is improved subsequently by appropriately planning the length of the pedal and adjusting the appropriate distance between the hip joint and the pedal axle and deciding appropriate inclination of this fixed link of this four bar chain that is the hip joint and the pedal axle center this is the fixed link in this four bar chain and its inclination with the vertical is appropriately adjusted so that the full half rotation of the downward stroke of the left leg or the right leg is completely utilized other investigators 
have proposed elliptical sprocket drive, some have proposed even non-circular drive for the driving sprocket, and we, our group only has suggested a double lever inversion drive. All these various drives, they have different effectiveness. If effectiveness of the conventional drive is considered as one, then the effectiveness of quick return ratio equal to one drive, the schematic shown just below the first sketch is 1.17 times, that of elliptical sprocket drive is 1.18 times, and that of the double lever inverter drive is 34% more. Yes, the schematic shows the driving link. AB is the second link which is connected with this overlay. This is on the machine or the rotary driving press. At the end of this link B, at point B, there is a hammer as shown. And as this link O1A, it rotates. It also turns AB in the vertical plane. <coughs> and when AB, it comes di diametrically opposite as shown. When AB acquires the horizontal position, it gives a very big impact on the anvil E. And if we place some hot piece between this anvil E and the bottom of this hammer B, then it gets a good impact for giving it a proper, proper form for this hot metal piece. This is how this rotary forging press, it works. Now we have tried this HPFM for many applications. This is a new application which is striking us. Because it is a new application which is striking us, and since it is not, since, since it is only tried so far <coughs> with electric motor, since it is not tried with HPFM, it is our proposal to new researchers to or to try out this rotary forging forging press to decide its compatibility with this novel energy source that is human powered flywheel motor. Now, if this assignment is taken by any self financing institution, as HPFM is already established, there is no funding required and if there is no need of repeating this project now. What is required to be executed is checking compatibility of this electric motor compatible rotary forging press, how it is compatible with HPFM. For that, they are required to fabricate this driving link O1A and this rotating hammer AB with appropriate hammer at A and B. This assignment should be given to the next year's undergraduate project batch because when it will come to organizing funding, they themselves will organize the funding. This is what is the practice followed. <coughs> Unfortunately, in self-financing institutions, right from the beginning of their inception till it continues the same fashion of funding for undergraduate project, unfortunately continues. There are some exceptions wherein <coughs> some self-financing institutions, they do provide some funding to them because we know the limitations of self-financing institutions, they have to organize funding for so many things. So it is obvious that they will organize very little funding for undergraduate projects. But if this concept is adopted by the seniors of self-financing institutions, then over the time, <coughs> they will be able to do very good headway in realizing the hardware-based research culture in their institute. Other process units which are already tried with this HPFM just for the information of the audience is low head, low head water lifting, wood turning, algae formation machine, clothes washing, potter's wheel, clay extruders, <coughs> rectangular bricks, heat bricks, line flash sand material, wood strips cutting, sweets hammer, chaff cutting, food grains crushing, rice husking, turmeric cleaning, dry chilies crushing, concrete ingredients mixing, pallets making. This is the photograph of schematics of application of chaff cutting. This is the bicycle mechanism. This is the flywheel, which is the energy source, HPFM. This lever, 
is shown, which is to engage TFC torsion in feasible clutch. This is the conventional Kadwa cutter. From this side, one end, uh, left extreme side, the Kadwa, that is the chop, is admitted with this Kadwa cutter and it gets crushed <coughs> during one complete cycle of operation of this chop cutter. This was the experimental setup of one of my doctor research candidate, Professor Zakiuddin, who is presently the Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the Specialization in College of Engineering, and other persons are the observers and those who were having inquisitiveness to see this setup. The photograph is taken along with them. Friends, for your information, I have executed this work partly totally myself and partly along with my research scholars, and I established a school of research on HPFM energized rural, village, and interior-based process machines. Towards this, I submitted a thesis towards the highest research degree, Doctor of Science in Engineering and Technology, that is DSC Engineering and Technology of RTM Nagpur University, which I received in the year 2016. <coughs> the other process units tried, its photographs are shown. This is the nursery fertilizer mixer. A flywheel is seen in the upper photograph and the mixer drum is followed by that. It is its top, a, a cover is opened. Inside that you can see an axle and you can also see the mixing blades. This is again the experimental setup for clay extrusion for uh, HPFM energized brick making machine and Next photograph, it shows the first brick making machine, which I developed way back in 1979 to 82, for which Maharashtra Housing and Area Development Authority, Bombay, it provided the funding. About 40 years back, funding provided was just of two lakhs rupees towards the sponsored project when I was working as assistant professor in mechanical engineering at that time VRC, now VNIT Nagpur. This is after we establish this feasibility of extrusion of columns of lime flash sand for brick making. We tried the suitability of this energy source for wood turning process or not. This is the photograph showing the wood turning process energized by HPFN and towards left extreme about two inch diameter and about 15 inch long wood stock is seen. This is same photograph on the other angle. Now, it is my proposal to any self-financing institution to establish complete technology of HPFM energized process machines, which are mainly rural, village, interior region based, particularly in the regions of jungles. For this, information should be first sought as regards which process unit should be energized. For that, the senior faculty members of the institute must make contact with several organizations and should do a first stage study of some basic main information. The organization which should be consulted for this are number one is Vanwasi Kalyan Ashram. This Vanwasi Kalyan Ashram is a government organization which is meant for the development of the life, improvement of the life of people staying in far interior, almost in jungles or nearby. What is their lifestyle? For which purpose they are making use of small capacity electric motors? Whether those operations can be performed by this HPFM if that is so, then those applications should be tried through undergraduate projects in self-financing institutions on which funding can be organized by undergraduate students therefore. The other items can be obtained in this thing. Those, those could be from Baba Amte Center, of, which is near Chandrapur. And there, if senior faculty members they make visit, they will come to know what devices human power they have developed 
and whether those all devices can be substituted by this human powered energy source study of book pedal power by professor dj wilson of mit usa for the information of the audience professor dj wilson professor emeritus of mechanical engineering of mit usa was my examiner of dsc thesis study of previous papers of journal human power of ihpva ihpva stands for the abbreviation international human powered vehicle association they are having publication of human power in that very many articles have appeared towards how to convert human energy into rotational kinetic energy and for which processes this energy is required to be implemented proper approach to realize this group of senior faculty members be formed to make list of such applications worthy of trying with hpfm decide one application every year a lot to proper group of students contrary to this unfortunately the thinking is ug students who bothers about them let them decide what to be done let them do it as a result what has happened is many robots are developed in undergraduate projects which are just four wheel vehicles battery driven unfortunately they are being treated as robots in some institutions this is most unfortunate this and what what so in this should not happen seniors heads deans principals vice principals directors should be serious about this resource and should take the proper steps in future to utilize this undergraduate project for generating appropriate funding in years to come for developing the institute research infrastructure here i would like to make mention of some other facilities which are available in society which should be made use of use of old parts market <clears throat> i mentioned about i developing the first hpfm energized brick making machine 40 years back when i was in vrc which was funded by maharashtra housing and area development authority bombay when issue came of fabricating flywheel the cost was very high because i wanted to have 1 meter rim diameter flywheel the cost was coming out to be almost 35 to 40 40000 rupees and total grant made available was just 2 lakh rupees it just stuck to my mind why not go to some old machinery parts market and see if some big size wheel is available at a very less price i went to about 10 km distant spot from vrc premises and i could locate in that old part market one fairly big flywheel old flywheel of 50 horsepower kirloskar machine lying in one corner <coughs> other parts which were there in that old part markets were all used automobile parts used clutch used gearbox used propeller shaft used differential used this planetary gear train in the rear axle speed reduction setup i just asked that owner of the old part markets how about this big flywheel lying in that corner it seems that that time he was very much fed up of that he said sab aapko ye chahiye kya i said yes i want it but uh, then he said yeah, you have to take it away because this is quite a lot bothering me it is lying here for last so many months and unnecessarily occupying my space you take it away you don't make any payment i told him no i am from government organization i will have to make some payment please tell me how much i have to pay for this i will certainly organize for its transport to take it from this place to vrc premises he said sir just 50 rupees de do aur ye flywheel leke jao so i could manage that flywheel just in 50 rupees the concept and idea of i am making this presentation is <coughs> whenever undergraduate student they think of building any experimental setup or developing any process unit or developing any mechanical hardware they should not think of fabricating everything afresh 
from buying, right from buying raw material, getting it processed in their workshop or from outside workshop. Just have a good survey of cold machinery parts market and try to procure the parts from there. It will reduce down their finance demand for their project considerably. If you visit the sites of Western coal fields, Maharashtra State Electricity Board, Ultratech near Chandrapur, Rashtriya Chemicals and Fertilizers Mumbai, Crompton Grills Mumbai, many other big industrial complexes in Mumbai, you will find that the machines which were not appropriately workable, which were manufactured in the manufacturing units, they are just sent to scrapyard, but some such scrap material is having fairly good utility from the point of view of experimental investigation, just to give an idea whether some logical idea is created in the mind of the young researcher, whether it is workable to a certain extent or not. In this context, such junkyard of big organization that also becomes useful and which will cut down the cost of the undergraduate, postgraduate projects to a great extent, even in some case, some portions of the experimental setups of, uh, of doctoral research. <coughs> Use of ITIs, industrial training institutes for fabrication skills of developing setups. It is my experience over the last 50 to 55 years now that in educational institution, while fabricating an experimental setup or some prototype, we get inadequacy from the point of view of having appropriate fabrication skill. There you must get in touch with local industrial training institutes. In one situation, I contacted the local Nagpur Industrial Training Institute. It is specially in the context of some Christian community. They have a very good ITI and they are having a very skilled staff towards fabrication, towards machining, towards welding. And we got it built from there with very less expenditure and a highly sophisticated device was obtained. Use of magazine industrial products finder. <clears throat> In my opinion, every education institution should have this magazine industrial products finder. The main objective of this magazine is advertisement of the various products developed by small to very big industries. If teachers study this magazine, they get lot many ideas from which they can decide the, what should be the new research projects they should undertake. For example, in the issue of 2018 of Industrial Product Finder, I got one page write up by engineers of Asia Brown Bovary. It was towards the development of very low synchronous speed induction motor. Imagine 500 horsepower induction motor with synchronous speed just in the range of 30 to 40 RPM. This was not known to me, though I hold first degree in electrical engineering. I was greatly surprised. I was thinking that normally the synchronous speed of induction motor at full load is somewhere between 1400 RPM to 1500 RPM. And these motors are used for some medium duty belt conveyors by big organizations like WCL, MSCB, big chemical industries and such continuous process industries like cement manufacturing industry, ultratech and so on and so forth. They are required to make use of belt conveyors at various stages of handling. Now, if the induction motor full load speed itself is in the range 30 to 40 RPM with very low speed reduction gearbox or perhaps in some situation, totally eliminating the gearbox, we can provide a direct drive between induction motor and belt conveyor. Imagine <clears throat> to what extent maintenance problems of such belt conveyors will get reduced down. It will improve the productivity of the user organizations and it will also improve 
the sellability of industries manufacturing these products. So this idea just I got by studying the book Industrial Products Finder. If somebody may think that industrial, industrial products finder is meant only for industry person. No, it should be there in education institution and every academician must also study it. He will get a lot of ideas regarding what appropriate devices should be used for his research models or research setups which he is going to which is going which is having in his mind to build and which he is going to manufacture and set up. This is an interesting example. Interpretation of advertisement in times of India, way back about 20, 30 years back. Once I had a look to ascent in times of India. It was in the context of seeing some job opportunities for my close relative. I saw to my great surprise, again by the Crompton Graves, a need of vibration expert. I started wondering why is it that the Crompton Greens need a very senior vibration expert. I can understand if they want to appoint some person who is specialized in electrical machines design. So I floated a communication to that time, Dean Research of Crompton Greens, I mean the Vice President Research of Crompton Greens, Mr. Kandan. I got immediately reply in three, four days. I just proposed them that I am wondering as to, it seems that you are in need of some vibration expert. Are you having something, new product to be developed, which is having relevance to vibrations? My field is mechanical vibrations. I would just like to check whether I could be of some use to you or my some colleague can be of use to you. Mr. Kannan immediately replied very positively and said, yes, Professor Modak, you please come down to Panjurmaag, Mumbai, we will have discussion. I went there with very good preparation of other issues also. Mr. Kannan organized meeting with 20 to 25 senior engineers of Crompton Greaves one full day. And then it was revealed that Crompton Greaves had an, had an order of huge number of transformers of above middle range with very low noise level. That is where they were stuck up. And they said that whether your teachers can help us in design of noise isolation of these transformers, we can join hands. That is how I could get one sponsored research project from Crompton Graves. My idea of emphasizing here is that starting from an advertisement in Ascent, I could reach up to this spot. I don't want to self-praise myself. I just want to indicate that friends don't ignore any available avenue, any available facility. Think over it very seriously, whether it has got any relevance to research activity. And if that is so, give a full thought to it, execute it. You will be personally benefited. Your organization will also get benefited. In uh, this attempt of trying of studying this advertisement in ascent and just checking, the VRC got one sponsored research project. Sponsor research project materialized towards design of transformer with no noise level. Observation of industrial work sites. I will propose to the middle level and senior faculty members of education institution to have industry visit. About 20, 15 to 20 years experienced teacher himself should offer himself for industrial visits at least once every month, once every week, not every month, every week. If he visits industrial work sites, he gets assignment towards what should be new development he should execute in his institute, either as undergraduate project or as empty dissertation or as doctoral research program or as even post back to research. Reveals tasks for analysis and design of new methods. This falls in the category of methods engineering and ergonomics. <coughs> Friends, methods engineering is a very important subject of industrial engineering. Mechanical engineering comes up to designing of new machines. 
industrial engineering teaches every member of the society how to manufacture it in industry with minimum of finance required with minimum of materials required with minimum minimum of human resource required and there in that teaching curriculum of industrial engineering methods engineering is most important subject if you have to perform any manufacturing operation maybe in the domain of mechanical engineering civil engineering electrical engineering how it should be properly executed that is what is taught by methods engineering if i talk in context of civil engineering take the example of fabrication of simple steel which is required for forming centering or plinth beams columns and slabs of ground plus one construction you see the figure on the right hand side that shows <coughs> a table provided with 0.35 meters 35 cm width 0.4 meter length and about 1.3 meter height a table is provided on that i have provided four spokes these spokes are of mild steel about 3 mm to 6 meter 6 mm diameter about 8 inches long and from, from the left hand side if a mild steel rod about 4 mm is admitted to the first vertical rod and push forward to the second coming to the left corner there if he performs hammering operation on this rod it will be bent to 90 degrees then again push it forward to come to the third vertical rod there again bent it to 90 degree then it let it come to the next rod then again hammer it bent it to 90 degrees and on the last rod again you perform here you are not required to perform hammering operation you take you take straight this out you will get the complete steel of made presently if you go to civil engineering work site what you will find a worker <coughs> is made to sit on the ground occupying squatting posture jisko marathi mein hum mandi ghalun bashne bolte hain paat ke upar baithte this is the most hopeless and most inefficient posture to be adopted by a worker working in industry because that tires him quite a lot only appropriate postures are sitting postures in appropriate seat or standing posture just as i am proposing your standing posture because the top of the table is about 1.3 meters high from the ground and sit stand posture this sit stand posture is found in very many seats in stores because the store operator is required to get down from his seat very frequently even this posture you can see <coughs> particularly in old style of working of banks we used to find very tall chairs it was from the point of view of having sit stand posture so <coughs> such work sites and operations in civil engineering their effectiveness can be improved by first viewing them the way they are being practiced identifying the shortcomings in them and then taking them up as undergraduate projects and onwards for its complete development in the process perhaps civil income civil engineering organization may become a co sponsor for such projects also in the area may domain of mechanical engineering there are several examples on the same lines the one which i have presented in the context of civil engineering <clears throat> if you happen to visit ashok leyland a plant at at bandara you will find how the truck assembly is taking place a truck chassis is admitted at left end on the moving conveyor of appropriate size and at about 10 10 to 12 station when chassis 
is admitted to 12th station of this assembly section. Near the conveyor, there is a heap of three to four tires with full air filled in. <coughs> Two workers, they approach the tire, hold it, bring it near the moving axle, and they make an attempt to admit this big size tire on moving axle. Imagine two workers holding big tire of the truck and making an attempt to assemble it over the axle of the rear wheels on moving chassis. How tiresome it must be. Upon asking the senior engineers of Ashok Leland that can we not have some mechanized system for this? The answer given was very surprising. The answer given was, sir, the same method is followed in Telco Pune. So the same method is followed in Maruti Noida. Perhaps they would have said the same method is followed in Ford USA. Same method is followed in other, other organization doesn't mean that one should not give a thought to improve upon it. This is exactly is the function of teachers of engineering college. When they are noticing this, when they are saying that this is ergonomically absolutely absurd, it must be improved upon, it becomes a task for new projects, maybe undergraduate, maybe postgraduate, may even be doctoral assignment. If somebody accomplishes this, I'm certain, 100% certain, you'll get a doctorate degree, followed by that a patent, followed that by a continued consultancy with big automobile shops. <coughs> Similarly, I would like to come to third item, that is packaging of biscuits in Bretman's Nagpur. If you go to Hinga MIDC, Nagpur, there's a plant of Bretman's food processing plant, they manufacture biscuits, and in the entire process of manufacturing of these biscuits, at one location, one lady in the age group of 25 to 30 years, slim stature, middle height, <coughs> is continuously counting 10 biscuits as those are admitted by one small plate conveyor to the location where she is standing. She counts. 10 biscuits from this floor, picks up that pack and moves it forward to the next station where it is wrapped in paper and appropriate packing material. This lady is performing the operation of counting 10 biscuits. <coughs> Almost for the entire day, 8 hours from 8 o'clock in the morning to 12 o'clock, then 12 to 1 would be lunch break, one to five again the same thing. I could see that her neck was making one fixed angle with the vertical. Her left hand was performing repeatedly the same movements. This repeated movements of the body organs that creates internal body injuries and because of the creation of this internal body injuries, over the time it over the time, it creates the occupational health hazard. <coughs> it creates the occupational health hazards. It increases the absenteeism in the plant that hampers the productivity of the organization. The organization is required to make heavy payment towards occupational uh, compensation. So friends, it is my proposal the senior faculty members of every institute, particularly Health Science Institute, to visit such industries themselves. Don't leave it to undergraduate students. Present practice is just to leave it to undergraduate students. Let them come to the teacher because teacher is as if their boss. And discuss with the teacher and he will report to him. I have seen such and such thing in such and such plant. I am going to take this as project. That is over. First discussion is over. Next discussion, again little more, more discussion, the teacher will tell his group of students, do the literature survey, 
but he will unfortunately he himself will not go to the industry and see the plant why such a style of working this should get improved sorry there is some interruption i will come back in no time this operation which i just narrated of counting 10 biscuits and moving forward this complete block for the next station this completely can be robotized so <coughs> such very many robotization assignments any institution get get this slide it shows centering for this is not plain it is plain the wing wh is the west height i am proposing here the earlier example i cited of manufacturing stirrups required for centering here the proposal is towards fabricating the complete centering i will not spare and i will not give any more time to this because a lot regarding this i have already spoken similarly in bulk solidus handling systems of western coal fields maharashtra state electricity board big fertilizers company big cement companies in belt conveyor system there is one such system belt taker and this belt taker is functional when a operating belt conveyor when operating belt conveyor it gets immediately stopped because of by because of non availability of electric supply the electric supply if that is switched off then the entire belt conveyor it comes to state of rest then when again it is restarted <coughs> then the total belt length it gets initially extended to a big distance if original if the full load belt conveyor total belt length is 80 meters then while starting the conveyor the total belt length initially increases from 80 to say 90 meters 10 meters rise is there and then when the induction motor driving this belt conveyor reaches its steady state speed then it comes back to 80 meters this belt stretch if that is made to induce in the belt conveyor very many times in a day because of the electricity failure then the belt fatigue will build up to its workable limit in a shortest possible time and we will require to frequently change the belt conveyor instead of this if we design an appropriate belt take up travel control system and propose to incorporate this in every belt conveyor system then that will improve the life of a belt in a belt conveyor this is a suggestion of taking up new research assignment for an institute important point is how i noticed it that is important that is by observing the functioning of an industry similarly in the electrical engineering domain elimination of flywheel in a process machine by proper power electronic circuit see <clears throat> even when i was in pce we developed one patent of evolving proper electronic circuitry comprising of cyclo converter two thyristors in anti parallel with variable gate control to modify the mm. starting torque characteristic of induction motor for every 20 millisecond and gradually build up the speed of the induction motor 
and thereby see that the driving is not required in a process machine. The other possible application, it could be through the concept of using DC motor as an energy source, with wherein DC motor will be energized by capacitor. I don't mean here the ordinary capacitor, I mean here a supercapacitor. The field of supercapacitor in electrical engineering is getting developed or it has already got developed to a very great extent. Proper use should be done of this supercapacitor. Here is a situation where supercapacitor should be tried. This title of this slide is Study of One Complete Series of Journal. I would like to skip this because of the paucity of time and would like to come to the next slide that is psychological strengths required for this act. I would like to have emphasis on this. <coughs> Your this present event is towards prerequisites of research. Our honorable chief guest today in the morning, he made very good suggestions towards the prerequisites of research. In my that speech itself, I was to make a mention of this, but because of the paucity of time, I just missed it, which I would like to detail it to some, some extent here. I request organizers to bear with me for five minutes. Every researcher must not only study the technical matter related to his research work, but also to a book of Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Pill. Researcher has to increase his psychological strength to a very great extent because researchers are not increasing their psychological strength to great extent. There are many cases even in some IITs of people having left their PhD. Unfortunately, in IIT Delhi, they are having one proverb. PhD stands for, PhD stands for, Pagal Hoke Dekho. In IIT Delhi, this, they speak this. What is PhD? Pagal Hoke Dekho. One of the biggest IITs of India biggest national institution, Indian Institute of Technology, that too in Delhi. PhD means what is spoken as Pagal Hoke Dekho. Why? Because in their PhD coursework, there is no component of psychological strength building, which is taught by Norman Vincent Pill. Just a 55 years book, 55 rupees book, easily available in the library of NEBS, Go today evening to next Dharampet, buy that book. Study first chapter. If you study that chapter, it builds your confidence. Believe in yourself. Second chapter is on peaceful mind generates power. If you come across any problem, keep your mind always peaceful. Pray God. Always constantly think over solution of your problem the solution must trickle down in your mind. Same thing happened with me. When I was doing one investigation on experimental stress analysis of thin shells, I was required to build a cylinder and piston wherein if I use a square threaded piston rod for moving the piston downwards, then the requirement was the piston should only slide down. It should not rotate with the lower end of the square threaded screw. I wanted to avoid rotation of this piston with the square with the lower end of the square threaded screw, where the lower end will rotate and actually move also. But I wanted to prevent rotation. So I brought about contact of this lower end with the piston sitting area such that 
If the area of contact is made zero, due to the clutch action, the torque transmitted is also zero. Adopting this concept of theory of machines, I could build a setup. How not to get tired? Third chapter is most important. Vincent Will writes in his third chapter, man doesn't get tired because of physical work. He illustrates the example of scientist Maxwell, whose day was of 48 hours, not 24 hours. Because Maxwell used to enjoy the work he is doing in his laboratory. He used to go to sleep in his chair while sitting. His secretary used to come, wrap around a blanket around his body, and go away. After three hours, Maxwell will get up, absolutely fresh, only with the sleep of three hours. He'll go to his kitchen, make a fresh tea, hot tea, have a one cup of tea, work back in his laboratory, again for 48 hours. If you dwell dirty thoughts in your mind, insecurity thoughts, inadequacy thoughts, thoughts of fear, you get tired. Nobody gets tired because of physical work. Whether you work for eight hours, whether you work for 10 hours, these days, the software people, they are <coughs> talking very high about them, that they are required to work for 10, 12 hours, or everybody can work 10, 12 hours. They are compelled to work for 10, 12 hours, that is why they are working. If you are not compelled to work for 10, 12 hours, because in a situation similar to executing doctoral research or executing any sponsored research program of any industry, there is no compulsion. You get tired because of dirty thoughts in your mind. Don't compare yourself with software engineers. They are bound to work, that is why they work. But they don't know. I'm certain they don't know this concept of how not to get tired. Friends, I had lot much other to speak to you. But because of constraint of the time, I'm required to make a stop here. So I'm making a stop here. And if you have any questions, a limited number of questions I can answer right away. Or maybe you can contact me on my email. You can contact me on mobile number. I'm always ready to answer your queries. Thank you very much for patient listening. <coughs> Moving further, if any participants have any doubts regarding the topic, feel free to ask in the chat box below, or else you can just unmute the mic and ask. Okay. 67 others. 67 Any questions? Okay, let's move forward. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for sharing your astounding success with us. All the ideas that you shared regarding the financial aspects related to research and development were very remarkable and beneficial for the would-be researchers. Lastly, I thank you for giving your time and making this session proficient. Thank you, sir. Moving towards our next guest speaker. Research is an organized and systematic way of finding answers to questions. Systematic because there is a definite set of procedures and steps which you will follow. Certain things in the research process are always done to get the most accurate results. Organized in that there is a structure or method in going about doing research. It is a planned procedure. 
not a spontaneous one. It is focused and limited to a specific scope. Finding answers is the end to the research. To put more light on this topic, I would request our next resource person, Dr. R. L. Shivastava, sir, ex-professor, YCCE, Nagpur, and former chairman of Institute of Engineers, Nagpur. He has more than 38 years of teaching, training, consultancy, research, industrial, and administrative experience. He has had his education and training in mechanical or production engineering at BE, MTEC, and PhD level. He is an MBA as well. He is also a certified master black belt in Lean Six Sigma and qualified lead assessor for ISO 9001, QMS, and ISO 5001, ENMS. He is an examiner for IMC, Ramkrishna Bajaj National Quality Award. He has contributed 250 papers at national and international level at various journals, seminars, and conferences. Please, sir, share your knowledge regarding the foundation of research. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, uh, good afternoon, friends. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, yes sir, you're audible. Ah, man. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, friends, uh, in this uh, three days uh, workshop, which P. Rashmi College of Engineering has organized on research and development <coughs> or prerequisites for execution of research work. Friends, research and higher education and teaching, they go hand in hand today. With the world changing so fast, the only way we can possibly have a track on the developments and be along with the changes is be abreast with the knowledge and do research within our interests and our limitations. So how to go about doing a research? So I've chosen to speak on the very foundations of research as to what research is and how should we take up research? What are the various types of research and how can we go about uh, selecting a topic and then carrying out research? So these fundamental concepts uh, we shall be discussing and uh, I would be happy if uh, you ask me questions, shoot them at me whenever you have one. Right? So you can stop me and ask questions. Uh, we, have, we have time, I hope at the end of my session also where you can ask questions, but if you have questions anytime in between, do ask. So let us uh, start uh, the session. Rakesh sir, you are not audible. Uh, so actually, he is, he left the meeting. I guess there is some network issue. That's it. Am I audible now? I'm back, I hope. Yes, sir. You're audible. Yeah, there is some problem. Uh, 
sharing my screen. I don't know what's the problem. But anyway, we can continue without. Uh, uh, could you please try sharing the screen? I'm not in a position to share. That's what I'm saying. Okay, okay, okay. So I guess now you can try to share the screen. Okay. Present now I have to go there, ne? Yes, sir. Your entire screen it is asking me. Ah, yes, sir. Share. Yes, sir. Share the entire screen. Okay, okay, okay. Pick up. Is this visible now? No, sir. So you can just uh, mail it to uh, someone. We can just share the screen from here if it is not possible from your side. Just check up. Just check up. I'll do that. Okay, sir. Uh, sir, if possible, please send the PPT to the mail ID given into the chat box. Uh, we will present your PPT. Fine, fine. Sorry. Uh, Kushi, please take care of this. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll send it to Girish sir, will that be okay? Okay Hello. sir. Oh, we can... Uh, sir, are you sending on WhatsApp or mail? Any mail only I'll be able to send. This also I'll not. Can we go without it? Like, will that be okay? If I... I'll share it sometime afterwards. Let's... Let us... Uh, do it without. Uh, am I audible? I hope. Uh, yes, sir, you're audible clearly. Uh, I'll say, you can share it with uh, the participants later on. Uh, I would like to go ahead with the talk now. Okay, okay sir. Okay. No. Please, please. Bear with me, friends. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, what uh, we essentially have to know about basics of research is. From where do we get the knowledge? And what exactly is research? How do we classify it? What is the process of research? And how do we design a research? And things like that. Right. So I've been given about uh, an hour's time. So I would like to uh, take so much and invite your questions. You can stop me at any point of time and ask your questions as I've said. Right. So. One of the most fundamental uh, things that God has given all of us is our five senses and the experience that we have through those senses that we have. Right? So sense experience, the individual experience that one has through one's senses is a wonderful source of getting knowledge. In fact, when a human being is born, he absolutely doesn't have any knowledge about the world he, is, he has come into. But through his senses, he gets a lot of knowledge and he develops as a human being, as an adult, as we are all today. 
Another source of knowledge is the faculty of reasoning, which only human beings have been given to a very great extent. There are other living beings also who have got the reasoning capability, but that is very, very limited. But we, in fact, we humans are very, very fortunate and lucky to have a wonderful sense of reasoning. If we want to seek knowledge, another very important area is ask the expert, ask the people who are the authority in their domain. We can approach them and get the knowledge that we are seeking by talking to them. And the last one is our own intuition, right? our own thought process, our own thinking, which can give us a lot of knowledge, which may be wrong, which may be right, right? because intuitions uh, may not always be right. They are basically our perspective of looking at things and we make aura. Right? But if we have the fundamental uh, understanding of doing research and gaining new knowledge, even intuition can be converted into a wonderful knowledge which could be testified and certified globally. Coming down to what are the various methods of getting, scientific methods of getting the knowledge, uh, there are historical methods then there is a method of comparison, one with two, apple with oranges and things like that. There are structural methods available. In fact, most of the research that is carried out in academic institutions is based on some structural uh, thing. Then there are functional methods also. Whenever we have got to uh, study uh, a system, a company, or its products and processes, we can go in for functional kind of research. And then there are two most important and most common methods of uh, scientific research. They are, one is deductive method and the other is inductive method. So when we talk about deductive method, it is like saying, having a basic theory, a fundamental theory, and from there deducing us it to our application getting some knowledge out of it. So it is from whole to individual parts. So that, that is deductive method. The reverse of this is the inductive method. We have small, uh, small developments, small knowledges. We can combine and integrate all this and come up with uh, a big idea or uh, a big method, a big process, a big product. Right? These called as the inductive method. So these deductive and inductive methods are one of the most popular, some of the most popular methods which normally the researchers would like to get associated with. Coming down to what exactly is research? Research is in fact search for knowledge. Right? It is in fact a scientific and systematic search for pertinent information on a specific topic which is important to the researcher, right? So it is also called as an art of scientific investigation. Uh, there are a couple of definitions uh, that have been given. One of the advanced learners dictionary, it describes research as a careful investigation or inquiry, especially through search for new facts in any branch of knowledge. Redman and Murray, they define research as a systemized effort to gain new knowledge. So essentially, research is actually a movement from the known to the unknown. Once again, I would like to repeat this, friends, for all of you. Your attention, please. Research is essentially a movement from known to the unknown. All those of you who are engaged in research, right, you must be seeing that you started, you started with doing the literature review, trying to find out what has, what is the existing knowledge, the knowledge that is known in the field. We take up that as our base and then move on 
to something which we call as the research gaps. So we try to pick up some research gaps and through our work, we try to fill up those research gaps and develop new knowledge. So that something which was not known through our work, we try to make it known to the world. So therefore, research is essentially a movement from the known to the unknown by plugging some of the research gaps that we have identified through the literature review that we undertake during the initial stages of our research. It is also called as a voyage of discovery. A voyage of discovery. We discover newer and newer systems, processes, products, technologies, and so on. Like we say that necessity is the mother of invention. In terms of research, inquisitiveness is the mother of all knowledge. And knowledge and research, they go hand in hand, right? So it is the inquisitiveness that drives research, that drives the search for new knowledge. So research is doing searching again and again. So what exactly do we do and how do we do it? A researcher, he observes a phenomenon, then collect the data about the phenomenon, analyzes the data and draw conclusions. Right? So this is the procedure for doing research. So this is how a researcher uh, would normally be doing research, observing things, observing phenomena, observing the systems, collecting data from them, analyzing that data, and then drawing conclusions, drawing inferences. And this, if you go on doing again and again, again and again, searching it, doing it again and again, it will be called as re plus search research. The question here comes is, why should we do it again and again? Having observed a phenomenon, having collected data, having analyzed it, and having drawn conclusions, why do we need to go back again to that system and start observing it again and again? The answer is pretty simple, friends. We are in a world, a universe, which is where change is the only constant. And the pace of change, friends, these days is very, very fast. And because of this change, by the time a researcher completes the study of one such system, which he has undertaken to, to search or to do research on, by the time he completes the research, many part which he has already studied becomes obsolete or near obsolete. New systems have come up, new knowledge has come up, and therefore researcher is all continuously required to do, to have an eye on what is happening beyond the world. So this literature re review literally continues right up to the stage when you start writing your thesis. It is because of the enormous pace which is with which the entire human race is going through. We need to do this again and again. If there are any questions, friends, as I've said, you can ask me. One of the most important uh, and comprehensive definition which I have come across as far as research is concerned is by P.M. Cook and the salient features of this definition are research as per Mr. Cook, its characteristics are the first and the foremost that it has to be an honest and exhaustive process, right? So a researcher has to be very, very honest and he has to do it very, very exhaustively. So honest and exhaustive approach. This, these are two very fundamental requirements of carrying out a research. The facts have to be studied with understanding. 
unless until you understand the phenomenon yourself you won't be able to go further so developing the right understanding about what you have chosen to study is very very important so developing the right understanding becomes the next step for carrying out a good research the facts that we have undertaken to research ultimately friends they would do what it is in fact something which we are in darkness and through our research will go to the light world so whatever the problems that we had undertaken to work on ultimately they will see the day of the light we'll get the solution so most of the research they are essentially problem centered and research leads to developing solutions to those problems whatever findings that ultimately you have they have to be validated and they have to be verified if you say something to the world that yes this is what the research which i have done and as per my research this phenomenon would be have like this if we have an existing thing like this the next thing which is going to happen is this no world nobody is going to believe us until until unless and until friends we validate to the world that yes this is how this phenomenon is going to work so validation and verification becomes very important things to show to the world that yes what we have done is right and people can believe in us and finally friends what research must do it must add new knowledge that unknown thing with which we started becomes known right and you may take up that known thing and somebody else may then try to find find out future unknown things which is linked to that new knowledge new known that you have brought uh, to the world so that's what the research is if you try to classify this research there can be several ways we can do that uh one of the classical ways of defining a research or calling a research is a fundamental or basic res research which is essentially a research done usually in academic labs in the institutions right in the laboratories of the institutions fundamental or basic research where fundamental theories em emerge fundamental knowledge emerges the other kinds of research is an applied research most engineers or most professionals i won't restrict myself to engineers it could be a pharmacist could be a medical doctor it could be a, an architect it could be a businessman right whenever they undertake research that would be an applied research because they will take up the basic uh, research knowledge the basic theorems the basic knowledge from the field and apply it to their professional knowledge to their professional problem and therefore it is called as an applied research then coming down to the way the research is carried out there are two ways it can be done one is called as an explorative research and another is called as the experimental research so what is the difference between these two kinds of research explorative explorative research and experimental research explorative research is one wherein the entire world the field outside is is the field of research we need to explore that and draw collect data analyze it and draw conclusions so it's called as an explorative research while experimental research would obviously be confined to the boundaries of your labs right maybe labs of the institutions or labs of the industries or csir labs or maybe any other professional labs that have been developed so whenever you your research gets confined to the labs and it is out of the experimentation that you carry out it is called as an experimental research and then there is a case study research a uh, research specifically to a specific problem that is called as a case study research and survey research is another 
a class of research, uh, which is very closely related to the explorative research, which we discussed earlier. So how do we explore? We usually go through a survey, design a questionnaire, interview people, discuss with them, and then collect data through that, and then analyze that data and do our research. So that's the survey research. Then evaluation research. Now, there are several uh, things which happen in our day-to-day -day world, friends. Uh, a bridge has collapsed, a ship has sunk, a uh, big earthquake has come, an avalanche has come, right? These are sample cases for somebody to evaluate and know as to why that has happened, what has happened. The researchers, most of the research, researchers these days are interdisciplinary research. Ultimately, when we talk about the humanity friends, we all know by now that it is not confined to our silos, mechanical, electrical, computer, civil. The boundaries are getting shattered. And most of the research problems today, they are interdisciplinary in nature. And the research team which does this kind of research is a multifunctional research team. So these are, this is a basic uh, thing about various classes of research or kinds of research. Going further, what exactly is the research process? How does a researcher does it? It is, in fact, a seven-step procedure. I'm sorry, I'm not in a position to sh uh, share you the PowerPoint presentation, but which I'll uh, certainly send it to the organizers and request them to share it with all of you friends. So the seven step research process, it begins with the first step is defining the pain, the problem, which is called as the research problem. How does one define the research problem, the pain area? It could be a societal problem. It could be a problem in the neighborhood. It could be a problem in your family. It could be a problem in your society. It can be a problem in your institution. It could be a problem facing your nation, right? So trying to identify that and taking that up as a case for investigation is the step of defining research problem. Having done this, we move on to the next phase, the second phase out of this seven uh, step or seven phase research process. It is reviewing the literature. Right. So it can be divided into two parts. The so first is going through the concepts and theories behind the subject of research which you have chosen to work on. And the second part, reviewing the previous literature previous research that has been carried out in your chosen area of research, right? So you need to do a very in-depth, very comprehensive literature review. Uh, these days in modern day science, I would put it simply that an exhaustive literature review in today's research would be going through last 10 years of the research work that has been published in all the national and important international journals related to your area of work. Go through, list down all the journals and last 10 years with the papers, publications <coughs> in those journals, you need to go through. If you can do this, this would be called as the comprehensive literature review as far as today's research is concerned. The next thing we come down to, the formulation of hypothesis. What is a hypothesis? Hypothesis is the researcher's own assessment, his own thinking, his own perspective about the research problem that he has chosen, about the phenomenon which he has studied and collected the data, reviewed the literature, collected the papers, studied them, and now he is in a position where he can possibly guess that this is how 
the result are likely to be? Or these are the questions which must be answered through his research. So this guesswork on the part of the researcher, having gone through, having selected the area, the subject, and having gone through the detailed, exhaustive research uh, review, literature review, he now he is now in a position to guess as to what what are those questions which needs to be answered through your research, and that is called as formulation of hypothesis. So maybe four, five, ten such hypotheses, ten some questions, or ten such sent sentences. Like this is how I think going to happen. This object is going to behave like this in these circumstances. So you've got to write down some such eight, ten sentences. It is your perception about the phenomenon which you have undertaken to research, undertaken for research. Right. So this is called as the formulation of hypothesis, the third important step. And then we come down to the core of the research process. Process number five, or step number five, uh, four, I'm sorry, which is designing the research, right? How does one design their soul, uh, the research, so that one finds out answers to those research questions or those research hypotheses which one has written down for his or her research, right? So how does one can design the research? so that those answers can be validly found out. So this is called as design for research. Having done this, one will move on to the fifth step of this research process, and it is called as collection of data. So you've got to come up with a data collection plan from where and how a valid, reliable, rational data would be collected. So you're going to come up with that data collection plan. So that becomes the fifth step. That will bring us to the sixth step, which will be analyzing this data, right? Analyzing this data. So you can, there are several tools which are available. There are several statistical tools that are available. There are several uh, scientific tools and methodologies that are available, which a researcher can uh, jump on to select and then carry out the analysis of data which he has collected in phase number five. So once you analyze the data, what you do, you find answers to your questions. Once you start interpreting, interpreting those results which you have got after anal analysis of your data, right? So you will now get the answers to those hypothesis which you had formulated. Some of the hypotheses you could have been right. Some of them you could be wrong, right? So this is the entire research process. The seven steps of, or seven phases of this research process. So there is always a feedback loop. There is always a fast forward loop in this research process, right? So, and the time which normally a research problem in our educational institutions for doing a full-time research, normally it should be about three, three and a half years to carry out a good research. And the research which we normally carry out as professional engineers would essentially has to be, it has to be an applied research, finding a solution to a problem which is hurting somebody, which is giving pain to somebody, right? We must always, try to find out answers to the societal pains, pains or pains of the industries. One of the very thing which is common in research design, whatever kind of research you are in, this is fundamental and applied to every research, whether it is explorative research, whether it is experimental research, whether it is a case study research, friends, please try to understand that when we are trying to do research, we are doing research for the population, right? We're trying to develop theories, concepts, methodologies, tools 
for the entire population which could be applied and should be applied anywhere and everywhere right so the entire population becomes the study of our scope of our study but how do we carry out research we normally take out some samples from this population we draw some samples and this we call as our data right so that data would be very very small from this big population and we study that data right those samples we use statistical analysis to uh, draw those samples right either through experiments or through explorations through surveys through questionnaires whatever whatever right ultimately what we do we draw some small samples right which we do randomly so that they are not biased they are valid they are reliable right so therefore that data collection plan is very very important which is essentially designing drawing of samples right and then we study this sample i mean sample is nothing but the data which we have collected and this sample which is our data we then try to analyze right and when we analyze this da data which gives us a lot of information right having drawn that information we have got to come back to our population because what we have done friends in every research i'm saying every research friends this is what happens that you start with universe the entire population from there draw some samples which you call as your data analyze those samples which we call as data analysis and then draw inferences from that and relate it to the population with which you started so friends this process of starting from the population collecting samples analyzing samples and then taking some decisions which you are going to take and apply it on the population with which you started with which was very very big a lot of probability comes into the picture and fortunately we have a very wonderful science of probability and statistics which has been developed you can decide the level of confidence with which you would like to go in 99% confidence level 95% confidence level 90% confidence level or 99.9% confidence level so depending upon this confidence level with which you would like to do your research this will decide the size of your samples a 95% sample size would be much smaller than a 99% sample size a 99.9% sample size would be much much bigger than a 99% sample size right so depending upon how much error uh, we would like to permit in our research we decide this level of confidence which is usually 95% or these days it could be 99% also so this is a word about what is research design going further having understood what exactly is basic research what are its various types and how what is research process and what is research design let us now try to spend maybe 3 4 minutes on trying to understand as to how can a researcher decide one's problem area or his research is or her research proposal there are several approaches to that let us try to understand a few of them one of the most fundamental approach is going back to books and libraries and carrying out a literature review it will give you a lot of ideas as to what is known and more importantly what is not known because it is which is not known what ultimately become your work area a part of that would become your work area right so carrying literature review is still one of the most popular 
approach for knowing or deciding your research proposal. The next is the field or industry problems. Wherever you are working, your neighborhoods, they are facing lot many problems. They have several issues. You can pick up some of those issues right, and start working on them. So they becomes your research proposal. Extension studies are another areas. At the end of every research thesis, friends, you will have last chapter as what else can be done from now on. Right? So you can pick up some of the things which the researcher has left and the things further research can be carried out in those areas. But mind well friends, there is a big catch there. Usually those areas are those areas which could be relatively difficult to work, which may involve more complex studies, which may involve more complex tools, which may involve a large expenditure for financial viability, technical viability, overall uh, scope viability, you must try to scrutinize such approaches, the extension approach from these angles, and then only try to select your proposal out of this approach of using further study from the literature, uh, from the thesis that have been submitted. Coming down to patent information, uh, bureau. One of them does exist in Nagpur these days. We have a patent information bureau at Nagpur and civil lines opposite our RTMNU. Right? And, and sorry, it has been shifted now to seminary hills. Right? And these patent strings and copyrights, if you try to study them, they will give us a wealth of information. And we can obviously try to take up some patent and try to go further on that. Internet, everything at the touch of a button, right? We are very fortunate to have a wealth of information available at the touch of our buttons, right? But there are several limitations on this as well. I don't think I have time to discuss on them. Interactions with peers, colleagues, experts is another very wonderful approach of identifying research. And one of the most important things which I normally prefer is keeping your eyes open, your observation skills. Always try to look around yourself, friends. Society is burdened with many, many problems, right? If you keep your eyes and ears open, Right? If you observe very keenly several research proposals you can get into by developing this habit of keen observations around yourself. And as I've already said, society at large, nations, they are having several, several problems as engineers, as professionals, try to solve some of them make them your research areas. Now, if you talk about research problems, right? There could be simulation problems, there could be survey problems, there could be case study things, you can model it, you can optimize a process, you can simply solve a problem, right? So there can be several such categories. I've only take, told you a few here. Now, some of uh, a couple of case studies, a couple of problems that you know, me and my uh, scholars, they have carried out over the last 15 years of my experience as 15, 20 years of my experience as a researcher, I would like to share with you at this point of time. Uh, one of the studies which we did uh, was entitled Achieving Organizational Excellence Through Six Sigma. Six Sigma, you know, friends, is a very powerful methodology which is being used 
all over the world. Uh, pretty old now, evolved in 85 at Motorola, USA, and came to India through GE, through Wipro and GE collaboration in early 90s, and now it's almost everywhere in our country too, right? So we took up a, a research study as to how to make this Six Sigma applicable and it deliver results in our Indian industries. So it was wonderful work which we carried out some nine years back. The final thesis was submitted, results were out and it has become uh, one of uh, uh, the uh, knowledge base for most <laughs> industries to apply. Yeah, please. Hello. Yeah. So this was one. Anybody, any question? Another thing which uh, uh, we worked on was evolving a green manufacturing framework. We know friends that environment has become very, very important. It affects every facet of our lives. And it is our responsibility to live a greener world to the next generation, right? So from this point of view, how to make our manufacturing green, we undertook this work and developed a green manufacturing framework for sustainable development in our industries. So likewise, there are some more work which we have undertaken. I would not go into those details now. There are several journals. You, at the tip of you, write down the area of your research and put it on the Google. You will get a list of journals, right? Try to identify journals which are indexed one. And where should they be indexed? First, minimum, they must be Scopus indexed. Next, <clears throat> higher level of journals would be indexed as SCI journals. Right? Or WOS journals. So these three indices, all those journals which Google gives you, these index journals scoping for starting from Scopus, ending with SCI journals, you must select some all journals and go through last 10 years research papers that have been published in these journals. So that would become the starting point for any research in this modern days. So to finish up friends, to me, research is a lot of fun. It is satisfaction because you have come up with a new knowledge. You have found solution to a problem. It is wealth generation. If you come up with a couple of patents and copyrights, right? There, are, there would be people who would be willing to pay for that, to get, get that knowledge from you. So it may lead to a lot of wealth generation. It is essentially a knowledge creation. So have the satisfaction of creating new knowledge. It is a step which will add value. So it is value addition. And it is a positive contribution from your efforts. And it is a step forward in the direction of improvement. So research is improved and basically it is problem solving. So it has all these features, friends. It is fun. It is satisfaction. It could be wealth generation, knowledge creation, value addition, positive contribution and improvement, a step in the forward direction and essentially problem solving. And above all these, the research fundamentally, friends, is common sense. 
the biggest characteristic of research is that it is nothing more than common sense it is another thing that this common sense is becoming more and more uncommon these days very very unfortunate but friends that is a fact the earlier we accept it the better it would be for all of us that that the common sense is fastly missing from our profession from our daily lives from our professional lives from the educational uh, boundaries as well as the professional boundaries let us get it back in our work areas personal as well as professional lives let us let us bring back common sense back the best way to do is start doing research uh this is where i would like to finish i suppose i am on time i was given 130 is the time we are two minutes away from that if there are any questions friends please do ask questions your questions please we are having a question and answer session right now i will be helping you up with the questions sir yeah please now i request the attendees to write down the questions if you have any in the chat box below or else you can unmute your mic and ask please write your questions in the chat box I would be happy if you ask me questions, friends. Shoot them at me, as I've said. There are none, it seems. <laughs> no, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, just move I'll, forward. I'll, I'll, I'll take a minute. Uh, I am indeed uh, very, very, very much thankful to the entire Priyadarshini College of Engineering team to have convened a workshop like this, which is very, very important uh, in these days. Right, and uh, to all of you for having listened to me. I hope I could give you some basics of research through this small talk and interaction that we have had. on this online platform um, tomorrow's world would be both online and offline we hope another month or definitely by december or january we shall have offline thing also coming up so we'll have both online and offline things where a uh, blended mode is going to happen for transforming knowledge and information so once again thanks to everyone Thank you very much. I enjoy it. Thank you very much. Same here, sir. Thanks a lot for delivering such an uh, interesting information with us. We really appreciate your uh, you taking your time from your busy schedule. Thanks a lot, sir. Um, after this, uh, we are having a break. Uh, we are going to have the talk of Dr. Vyankata Krishnaiya Khandaga, sir. Emeritus scientist DRDO. He is going to discuss the advances of uh, of uh, and research areas in gas turbine technology. It's going to be very interesting and beneficial for each one of you. So stay tuned and join at two p.m. Well, thank you, Rakesh, sir, for joining. and now all participants are requested please join uh, at 2 pm sharp and the feedback link will be given uh, after the session of first day thank you so much to all of you
Okay, after two minutes, Amaya, you have to start the program. Yes, sir. Okay, may I please start? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. I am very thankful to you all for joining the session again. Thank you for your constant support and coordination. Moving ahead, leadership in gas turbine technologies is of continuing importance as the value of gas turbine. is projected to grow substantially by 2030 and beyond power generation aviation and the oil and the gas industries rely on advanced technologies for gas turbines market trends including world demographic energy security and resilience decarbonization and cluster profiles are rapidly changing and influencing the future of these industries and gas turbine technology To guide us more about this topic, we have an expert with us, Honorable Dr. Vyankata Krishnaya Sandhaga Sir, former Additional Director, GTRE, Emeritus Scientist, DRDO. He has a Master's Degree in Aerospace Engineering from IIT Madras and Doctor of Science, USC. He worked as Research Fellow at NAL Bangalore for a brief period and then joined joined HAL as a Design Trainee. and continued as an aeronautical engineer in hal before joining gtre as senior scientist to upsc he served as co chairman for cfd center of aeronautical society for 2 years member of aeronautical research and development board for 6 years core member of rag board for nearly 20 years he was awarded the aero india prize for academic excellence at iit madras and drdo technology award for establishing high altitude test facility at gtre i request you sir to share your treasure of knowledge with us over to you sir ki naam bol ka le okay ne bol ka presentation de main ba ka presentation de hello are you able to hear me yes sir and so shall i start my presentation Yes, so you can start. Uh, okay. Are you, see, uh, are you able to see uh, the presentation also on the screen? Yes, sir. Uh, it would be better if you uh, start the slide show. It would be uh, uh, cover the entire screen then. What is it? Slide show. Is it possible? Huh? Now. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. it's okay. It's okay. It's on the screen. Yes, sir. And uh, you are able to hear me. Yes, sir. So can I start my lecture, madam? Yes, sir, definitely. Okay. So good afternoon to you all, and um, it is after lunch. Therefore, my lecture I have to make it as interesting as possible, and uh, I'll be covering some of the advances and research areas in the gas turbine technology. Are you hearing me, madam? 
Hello? Yes, sir. You are audible. Oh, yes. Okay. So now let us uh, start uh, with some introductory work and then go to the advanced thing because anything we do will have to start from fundamentals. So there is a need to enhance the aerogas turbine technologies, even though there are thousands and thousands of military and even civil aircraft engines already in use. And um, here I have shown one of the engines of Pratt and Whitney, which they are trying now using using a geared turbofan. I think they are doing a lot of uh, work, excellent work. Uh, to see that the gear train will have sufficient safety as well as life. And we'll discuss that later. Now, gas turbine engine is an air breather engine, just like any IC engine. It's a but it is nothing but an internal combustion engine. The only difference between other IC engines and the gas turbine is that there is a continuous combustion in this. And instead of piston and cylinder, we have two more components apart from the combustion, where you will have continuous combustion. The first one is to suck the air from the atmosphere, that is compressor. And then this feeds the high pressure air into the combustion chamber, what is shown here, red. And there you add the fuel, you burn the fuel there. So once you burn the fuel, there will be some losses, it doesn't matter in the pressure but you will get a high pressure, high temperature gas. It is not air now, it is gas which enters the turbine. Once it enters the turbine, there will be pressure drop, temperature drop and power produced. And this compressor and turbine, they are coupled to each other, they are married to each other. They run in equilibrium at the design point, whatever design point we design. And then the exhaust, we have got exhaust cone or a nozzle here, propelling nozzle. And after doing the work and converting the heat energy into mechanical energy in the turbine, the rest of the gases pass through the nozzle where we get the change in the momentum giving the thrust. That is the uh, essence of a simple gas turbine open um, cycle gas turbine engine. Now we'll go to it, the Brayton, which is actually works on a Brayton cycle. As I mentioned, it has got compressor, combustion chamber, and a turbine. So it has got three major components, C, CC, and T. C, CC, and T. C, compressor, CC, combustion chamber, T, turbine, and then also CCN, we can see. Now the ideal gas turbine cycle is shown both in the PV diagram and on the TS diagram, temperature entropy diagram. Since this Brayton cycle, what I have shown here is an ideal cycle, that means there is no loss in the compressor. That means the entropy change is neg negligible or zero. So one to two is a compression here on the TS diagram without any loss, representative efficient. Two to three is a heat addition at constant pressure. So that is a constant pressure combustion chamber and a constant pressure, P, P2, if you call this yeah, inlet temperature as P1 and temperature uh, pressure as P1 and then the pressure is P2 there and heat is added in the combustion chamber here, this combustion chamber and then you get a high pressure and high temperature gas at the point three. Three to four is the expansion both in the turbine as well as on the nozzle and then the gases escape to the atmosphere. So this is the ideal Brayton cycle. So as you observe the diagram of the PV or even TS diagram, you find two important parameters in the gas turbine engine. The two important parameters are P2, this if you call as pressure P2, and this you call as P1, the pressure ratio P2 by P1. And then you see the top temperature of the cycle, that's T3, and the inlet temperature here, because this TS diagram, T1 here and T3 there. So the temperature pressure ratio, top temperature, sorry, top temperature ratio, that is T3 by T1, and the cycle pressure ratio, P2 by P1. These are the two important 
parameters for the design of the gastro management. So I have made it very clear in a simple way that in the ideal Brayton cycle, which consists of C, 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 and T, and the N nozzle, and this turbine is coupled to the compressor, they rotate at the same speed. The turbine, if it rotates at certain RPM, M, compressor also will be at M. And then the exhaust gases will go through the nozzle, which is not shown here again. And so we have in whether it is a real gas turbine cycle or an ideal gas turbine cycle, shows on Brayton cycle, we have two important parameters, P2 by P1 and T3 by T1. That is where the research has been done over the years, particularly the last 50 years. There has been enormous amount of increase uh, in the efficiency of the engine, in the performance of the engine, only considering these two parameters. If you do a simple cycle analysis by thermodynamic cycle, you'll find that if this is the pressure ratio, if the cycle efficiency, the overall efficiency, if you calculate, it increases with the pressure ratio to something like 25, 30, 40. Afterwards, it flattens out. So that is because when you increase the pressure ratio, with the idea you'll get more efficiency, you'll be loading the turbine. So it will flatten out. So in a way, we should be around 20, 25. For military engines, we are around 20 to 25. And for civil engines, now they go up to 35, 30 to 35. So the cycle pressure ratio is one of the important parameters that affect the efficiency of the engine. That means the fuel consumption. Because you are adding fuel in the combustion chamber, ultimately you are paying for it. So you have to consume less of fuel. That means the whole engine has to be efficient. And that efficiency in a, this ideal cycle, what I'm now discussing, it mainly depends on the pressure ratio. So when you are designing it, when you are thinking of designing any gas turbine engine, which is asked to do some duty, you have to think of the pressure ratio first. And this is this, you first you have to think of an ideal value, afterwards we'll see the, the real value. But this is the most important thing. And it now we understand that the pressure ratio only affects the efficiency. Nothing else. You please consider pressure ratio in the beginning of doing. You see, many research or the design fail, not in the end, but it fails in the beginning. If you take a wrong value or some of these critical values improperly. So one has to decide. Now, you see, the difference between any auto cycle or diesel cycle or Brayton cycle there you have a piston and a cylinder. That means if there is a person who is designing a cylinder, there's another person designing a piston, the matter is over, the engine is over. But if you, if you think of the gas turbine, you have three components. So we'll have three experts. One is a compressor expert, another is a combustion expert, and there's a turbine expert, and of course, rotor dynamics expert, because these two has to be coupled and rotate. Invariably, engine fails because of improper lubrication. Because they rotate at a very high speed, something like 15,000, 20,000. Some of the engines, military engines, go up to 50,000 RPM. So your rotor dynamics is important, critical speeds, etc., and also bearing chamber design. In fact, recently I have seen some of the engines which they have made, they have failed because of lubrication. Improper, what happens when it goes to high altitude, there will be a problem with the lubrication and uh, that means the lubricant consumption will be higher than what we do when we do the testing in the lab. And so there can be a failure. So it's, a, it's not only the three components, three experts will do it. And when they are assembled together, when they try to marry all these three, we get into a problem. So because there are three independent flaws, he will say, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. But when you club them together, it's like a cricket match. Not only a bowler should be good, the batsman should be good, and the fielders must be good. Then only win. And here also, all the three components, the experts may be all right. They would have done independently. But when you come to the combination and assembly, and then make an engine, then only the real thing comes out. So that is the main thing, problem in the gas turbine engine design and development. Therefore, it takes hell of a time, something like 10 years uh, from the day one. And a lot of money involved in it, a lot of experts involved in it, and a lot of heavy instrumentation, experimentation, 
and component design and so on and so forth. Now comes another problem. As I mentioned earlier, the two important parameters, this is the top temperature. How much can I go? This T3, I can burn the fuel as I like, but I get a temperature at a constant pressure, assuming it's ideal. Temperature T3, the top temperature can be 1600, 1700, 1800, Adiabatic flame temperature, is it? So you will have to think about it. When you think of the temperature ratio, that is T1, inlet temperature is atmospheric temperature, say 300K. Then if I say 1500K, I can run the engine, something like for 10 hours, 15 hours, or 1000 hours. Civil engines go up to 3000 hours. They normally have 1500K. So 1500 divided by 300 is about five. So if I see this line, the specific power output, of the cycle increases, say you choose a pressure ratio of 20 and you find that if you go T, T, 3 by T1, 5, is no use. You can see it is already flattened around a pressure ratio of about 12. So if you think of a pressure ratio of engine 20, better go for higher temperature. That means 6 into 300, 1800K. What a great thing finished because you should have proper material, and uh, the life of the gas turbine engine is in this t the top temperature and the turbine material. And therefore, you have to think very carefully how to choose the T3 by T1 and with the pressure ratio. And you have to, if you think of this 1800, then you have to go for cool, cooling the turbine blades from inside, apart from the best material that is available uh, for, uh, for us for the turbine design. So the cycle temperature plays a very important role in the life of the engine, that's number one, and also in the design stage itself. So these two parameters are very, very important right on the first day. Anything done wrongly at that wrong choice uh, at that point will lead to a failure that will be known only after, say, 10 years or even more. Because for the simple thing, if you want to make a turbine blade in India, it is difficult because we don't have private uh, companies who uh, do casting and also machining. So we have to go abroad. That means if you place order today, it will take three years for them to cast it as per our design because the drawing has got about 300 to 400 dimensions and about 100 um, rules and regulations are notes what we do. About three A0 size drawing sheets. So it takes a hell of a time, three years and about not less than um, three, 10 crores in dollars. So one has to be very careful in making thermal blade uh, machine drawing because it has, when we think of making uh, a thermal blade, we'll be very carefully choosing the top temperature because four of us have to agree. Number one, aerodynamic design, then mechanical engineering, mechanical engineering design. We have um, a lot of vibration problem, therefore we have to have an expert in the vibration, etc. And then manufacturing man, and then the heat transfer, thermal design. All the four of four of them have to sign the drawing. That is acceptable, then only it will go. Now let us see, uh, I have shown the two figures uh, in which, which actually contribute for the pressure ride. I mean, pressure ratio with efficiency and top temperature ratio for the specific work. Specific work means assume the engine is sucking only one kg of air per second. Assume it is the mass flow rate, we simply say mass flow, that is so many kg per hour. And it is assuming only one kg of air, uh, sorry, one kg of air per second, not hour, one kg of air per second, kg per second. Sorry, I uh, thought of fuel consumption. So one kg of air per second, we assume. And that is, then we calculate what is the specific power output. And uh, that's called specific power output because the air that is sucked by the engine is only one kg of air per second. Now, if you think of the actual cycle, what you have seen is Brayton, that is for understanding the fundamentals. Then when you think of the uh, actual uh, real cycle, you see here, of course, the same pressure ratio, you can see here, P2 by P1, 
and the top temperature, they have T3 by K17, we've shown that. But you see here, the entropy has increased. That means the compressor has an efficiency. Normally, we have efficiency around 82, and if you can get 85, best compressor. And uh, if you get 82, it's okay. And I don't think we, we can get more than that. 85% total, total, and definition will be seen later. So if you have uh, the compressor, which has got uh, uh, efficiency around 85, the line looks like this. Now you see the ideal temperature here, and it goes to the actual temperature in a test there at this point. Then you see combustion chamber. We assume the combustion to take place at a constant pressure, it won't happen. That's all. Idea. So there will be whatever pressure you gain in the compressor, we lose by the time you reach the top temperature. Usually, it is eight, uh, five to eight percent. Five is the best. Eight, okay, all right. We say the combustor is okay because when the combustor man designs and gives, we look at the pressure loss as well as, of course, we have temperature traverse quality also. Temperature quality is also important. The ex exit temperature quality that we call as pattern factor, we'll not worry about that. And uh, But most important thing is the pressure loss. If he gets more than 8%, we'll ask him to redesign. 5% is the best. For civil engineers, they go up to 5%. For military, you can tolerate because uh, it's a military purpose. You can, you can go up to 8%, 7% like that, 6% like that. So then you lose that much pressure to the turbine. It requires pressure as well as temperature. Then expansion takes place in the turbine. Uh, in the, it takes place from here to here. And that power developed here, from here to here, expansion turbine. Again, you see it's not isentropic. It has got efficiency, so entropy has increased. And it expands to certain pressure. And that power that is developed from here to here, four to five dash or five, whatever it is, is used to drive the compressor because it's, it is a self-sustaining engine. You cannot put power to drive the compressor outside. So if the turbine, they are coupled. If the turbine is coupled to compressor, and when you start the engine and go to the design, I mean, push the throttle, go to the design point, then this much energy is lost in the turbine to drive the compressor and work at the same speed. And the balance of the pressure and temperature is what is available is in the nozzle. So this expansion in the nozzle, again, that is not isentropic. It is a non-isentropic process because actually. So, for example, if the pressure drop across the nozzle, when it chokes, you will have uh, something like 1.8 as the pressure ratio approximately uh, for choking it, choking mass flow, of course. And this is the juice that is available actually for the engine to produce the thrust. The rest of it is consumed. The turbine produces power and compressor takes it. It's of no use for us. That becomes a perpetual machine then. Then you have to see this has to have a maximum value. This pressure and temperature to the atmospheric pressure and temperature. So that is what we see. And that is the one which gives the exact uh, power output or the thrust of the engine in the case of civil or military engine. And if you take, let us say, one kg of air per second, and let's say the expansion that is taking place here is uh, giving uh, the exit velocity Vj, jet velocity something like in the nozzle, propelling nozzle. So it gives uh, something like uh, 600 meters per second. And I'm using, let's say 100 kg of air per second, 100 into 600. Multiply and that will give so many newtons. 100 into 600. That will be the thrust that is developed in newtons in the engine. If you use only one kg of air, that's a specific thrust. One kg of air plus 600. That becomes 600 newtons as the specific thrust. So to get the high specific thrust, that means one kg of air per second use, you must get a high. Uh, otherwise, you high thrust, you must get specific thrust. If you don't get it, you will have to make the engine size bigger and you have to set more mass flow. And say so weight of the engine goes up, the size of the engine goes up, the uh, the man who has given the money to make the engine will not accept, the customer will not accept. He wants minimum weight and maximum output. So we had to concentrate in the, uh, what you call real cycle, 
this portion. If this portion is big enough, then only we get the best performance of the engine. So again, even in the real cycle, you have P3 by P1, uh, or instead of P2, you'll have to think of just P3, because of losses, P3 by P1, not P2 by P1 now. And top temperature also, you'll have to retain there, and T3 by T1. These two are uh, to, are to be considered with the losses, with the efficiency. That means the three engineers, uh, compressor engineer expert, combustion expert, the turbine expert, and the nozzle expert, all of them have to be a competent designers. Otherwise, you are not in the business. Because ultimately, what it tells is this, this portion. They'll check, the customer will check what you are getting here. It, it, it invariably um, gives you the problem with regard to the weight of the engine and the size of the engine. So this is this portion of the PV, uh, TS diagram is very important as far as thermodynamic cycle is concerned. Simple way, that is. Now, how do you specify the engine? Suppose a customer comes and tells me he wants uh, some things. Thrust only is worried about thrust and weight. Thrust to weight ratio, we call. So what happens in the civil engine, we have what is known as a turbo fan, we call it. And the military engine, uh, it is, uh, this is the type of the military engine. And you find this also we call as turbo fan or a bypass engine, we can call it. Because just to make a difference between turbo fan and even though this is a turbo fan military engine, we call this as a bypass engine. And this definitely is a turbo fan engine. And of course here, there's a big fan driven by a number of stages of turbine here. And this fan is driven by these red colored turbines, about five stages, six stages of turbine. There's a huge uh, fan. This sucks about, say, 800 kg of air per second. Huge. It is a civil engine. So you will have a bypass ratio, let's say 800 goes here and 100 goes there. Totally it sucks, let's say, 900 kg of air per second, this one. And when it sucks, we have what is known as bypass ratio, 800 divided by 100. This 100 goes in the core engine and goes to the combustion chamber. And uh, this is LP compressor, this is HP compressor, this is two spool. And HP turbine, LP turbine, and another turbine, power turbine here drives this one. So the idea of having a very high bypass ratio engine is that this is a cold thrust. As I said, the thrust is mass flow multiplied by V-jet. The jet velocity may be less, but a huge mass flow is coming, and you get a very huge thrust compared to the cold thrust compared to a hot thrust. Thus, you're saving the fuel. And that's what they want in civil engines, because otherwise the passenger fare will go up. And though it's a big engine, but it will suck about 800 to 900 kg of air per second and produce a huge thrust, and only little goes through the core core engine and produce a hot thrust. This is hot thrust and there's cold thrust. But together, you get a huge thrust. And here, because this is very high cold thrust, you save the fuel. That is the crux of it. So in, in the case of civil engine, we'll have a very high bypass ratio. This cold flow or hot flow is called the bypass ratio. In the case of civil, and in the case of military engine, we are not bothered about the fuel consumption and uh, safe, uh, the safety. We are only bothered about the thrust and other requirements, which I will tell later. So here, the bypass ratio maximum, what we think of uh, here is as a bypass, you can see, is a leaky bypass, something at 0.4. That means uh, 0.4 times the, the flow in the core. If it is one kg, here 0.4 kg goes. Like that here, if one kg goes, there'll be eight kg of air going. That's why eight is the bypass ratio. Uh, like that here, 0.4 kg goes here and 1 kg of air per second goes. So this bypass ratio is around 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, like that. Whereas here it's 8, 9, 10, 7, like that. So this is the main difference between a civil trend engine, this is a Rolls Royce engine, example. This is also EJ200, Euro, Euro, Eurojet, the latest EJ200, European jet, jet engine. And uh, this is the latest in the Rolls Royce. These are the two figures which I have taken from the Rolls Rice Journal, of course. Next, you can see the view of a civil aircraft engine. What you saw there was only 2D, and these are 3D, 
China. So you can see the big uh, fan. What you see is a big fan here. And uh, in fact, it is about 10 feet in diameter. I can just walk in. Six feet man can easily walk in inside. 10 feet, 9 feet like that. Whereas the core, core size is very less. And you see a bank of um, the turbine stages to drain this fan. Because it's a huge fan. And it will be sucking 800, 900 kg of air per second. And therefore, you require a number of stages of uh, turbine to drive that uh, fan. And the diameter, you can see the diameter of the fan is something like 8 feet, 10 feet, like that. So this is a view of a high bypass ratio of a fan engine of a civil aircraft. And uh, this example of the Trent engine, it produces about 9 1,000 kg um, of, uh, of uh, 9,000. Actually, it produces about 90,000 pounds. I think they always deal in the FPS system. About 90,000 pounds of uh, thrust it produces. And diameter, you can say about 3 meters. 3 means, uh, you can imagine, it's about 10 feet. And uh, the overall pressure ratio, as I told you, P2 by P1, is about 39. They are gone very high. And the maximum weight, I'm sorry, the mass flow, is, uh, there's a mass flow, 1,250 kg per second, there's a mass flow rate, and bypass ratio is about 9, 8.7, I was telling about 8 and all, now it has gone to 9, that means 9 kg of air goes here, means 1 kg goes there, and total mass flow, you can see 1,200 kg of air per second, a very huge one, and uh, trend 900, of course, you can give the thrust here, um, it is about 90,000 pounds of thrust. And you can see the aircraft here. You have got uh, um, both uh, upstairs here and lower also you have people sitting here. And this is a huge aircraft in which this engine is, is used, the civil engine. This is a Trent engine, I think 90,000 pounds of thrust it produces. And you just got a four engine. And you can see the range. It goes 15,000 kilometers from Delhi to New York. You can fly in this continuously over Atlantic Ocean or even Pacific Ocean on this side. So, such a huge aircraft. When you think of such a huge aircraft and you think of huge engine, you can imagine how much, of, how much amount of work has been done on the research side, on the design side. As I told you, research is not independent. That's why our Mehtaji uh, Girish Mahetaji is head of research and design. The design is for research is a forerunner of the design. Any design you want to make, you have to do some research and validate that research by experiments and then only go to the design. That is the thing. Anyway, research is a forerunner, especially in engineering. There is nothing like theoretical research. It has to be um, correlated with experiments. Experimental data should be there. Research philosophy you can produce, that is different, that is science. But when you think of technology, you do some research, you say I've done some research and I've got some data, it has to be verified experimentally. After verifying it in a lab scale, then only it will go to the engine cell. That may take even five years, five to two, six years, because we have to prove beyond doubt validation and verification of the theory or the whatever is a proposal that has been done in the research side. So as far as engineering is concerned, the research is ultimately coupled to the design. After validation and verification, it goes for the design of the component after that only. That's why R&D, they are always like brothers. So now coming to the specification, this is a military aircraft. Now he will say, our uh, customer, I want 20,000 pounds, that's about 90 kilonewtons. And with reheat, of course, there is a reheat. You see, the reheat is on here. And without reheat means dry thrust. It's about 60 kilonewton, 60 and 90. 60 kilonewton without reheat, that's dry heat, without uh, afterburner here. There's one component called afterburner here, where we burn again fuel and increase the temperature so that you get uh, jet velocity more and burn the fuel here and get in military only, not in civil engine. And you see, the, the problem with this is it will, it will be... Mm, sensed by radar because the temperature I mean hot gases can be sensed by radar and uh, you may be vulnerable for an attack 
but there are ways how to uh, avoid that also. So we put on reheat only when you want to chase the enemy or when you want to come out from the enemy territory, you put on and come out. Otherwise, don't use it because this will give a signature uh, uh, for the radar and uh, because IR signature will come and uh, the radar can detect it direct. But in any case, he says you want 60 kilonewton without reheat and with reheat 90 kilonewtons. All other things, once that fellow says, not only that, he will say the last point. The last point is I don't want any engine more than 1000 kg. Supposing your engine is 1200 kg, he will reject. The reason I will tell you is it is in the, this is a military engine and the engines are put in the rare fuselage. If you increase by even 200 kg, I have to put a blast here to get my CG. And once I put a blast, that weight increases, this weight increases, I cannot carry more fuel. And that means my endurance will come down. I have to attack the enemy a little deeper, I have to go, then I won't have fuel. So he will say never to exceed 1000 kg. And I want to be thrust that much, dry thrust so much. Now it is up to you. Decide what you want, how you do. So you, the designer starts and he will think of uh, a bypass ratio, as I told, is a leaky bypass. It's a 0.4 is to 1. 1 kg of air will go in the, the mainstream and 0.4 will go on the bypass. The pressure ratio, of course, I choose, as I told you, P2 by P1, influence the efficiency, but I cannot go as a, as a civil engine like 35 at all. I'll go around 25. Cover engine is around 22. So uh, then you can see this uh, EJ200 is a zero jet. Uh, this is the one where uh, the latest engine in the inventory of uh, uh, British British uh, aircrafts, uh, EJ200 engine, European jet uh, trainer 2000. It is in the 2000, uh, say maybe I think they uh, certified it in 2010 or something. And uh, it has got a HP, it's a two spool. I'll have to come to that later. It has got three stages of ELP compressor and five stages of HP compressor, highly optimized in that design. The experts have worked after a lot of research over a lot of time, period of time. It cannot happen uh, just like that. They might have worked for some 15, 20 years to get this type of uh, pressure ratio of 26 in three LP, three stages of LP compressor and five stages of the HP compressor. We have 22 in cover stage of LP compressor and six stages of HP compressor. Six and three gives only 22 in cover engine because that our design was long back. And now this is the latest one. They have improved the LP uh, stages and they are getting about, say they are putting here, uh, let us say, four, four or 4.5 as a pressure ratio. And uh, whereas we have only about 3.3 in the LP stage and the balance uh, in the HP. Then annular combustion chamber, of course, you have to study that very carefully. And only one stage of HP uh, turbine and only one stage of LP turbine is common. We cannot have multi stages. So the LP compressor is driven by LP turbine. HP compressor drives the HP, uh, HP turbine drives the HP uh, five stage HP compressor. And of course, annular uh, combustion chamber, the air spray automizes that. Uh, those things. Uh, uh, I think if I get time, I'll go through. And uh, now you see this is the engine. What you saw, this engine, uh, which is on the refuge or twin, twin engine aircraft, and this is the, the anatomy of the engine. You can see here the three stages for your compressor and five stages of HP compressor. This HP shaft it looks like a drum connected to HP turbine here. And the LP turbine connects the LP compressor three stage here. So you have a HP compressor here and LP turbine shaft, spool shaft goes inside. One shaft is inside the uh, other shaft. The HP shaft rotates about 15,000 RPM, whereas the LP shaft rotates around 10,000 RPM, one inside the other. Such a complicated animal it is. Extremely difficult, especially to make the bearing housing and uh, a tribology design uh, work, it is really tough. And also you have vibration problems because both are rotating one inside the other. Any problem, any small uh, imbalance at any stage or improper uh, assembly clearance or tolerancing will create the great uh, disease called the vibration. The engine cannot have more than, if you put on 
the accelerometer here on the engine, engine especially wherever the, here there's an intermediate casing where you have bearing for the HP compressor, uh, HP spool, as well as the LP spool. So we put an accelerometer here and here, check if the, if, the, if the vibration goes more than one inch per second in the velocity mode. Now, because British is all in inch on it's even now. So one inch, more than one inch per second, the engine is rejected. It goes back again, reassembly. So when we do the final check and put it on the test bed and we check the vibration, most important is vibration are these two points. If it is more than that, more than one inch per second is rejected. It will go back again for improvement. I mean, some, some error will be there in balancing. And you have the jet pipe where you have the afterburn system here. They've got uh, the V gutters to hold the flame. And then we have a variable nozzle, variable area nozzle. Because when you put on the reheat, the temperature goes up, therefore density comes down, and therefore the area, flow area has to be increased. And immediately there are petals which will be actuated. These petals will actuate and open the nozzle. Otherwise, the engine will simply search. By chance, these petals don't open properly, the nozzle, the engine searches, that's all. That's the end of the story. So many, many things are there. It's the most complicated animal in the world is the engine, aero aircraft engine. So it is very tough to design, develop, and uh, um, apply research methodologies everywhere. You think of seals now. You have got, um, because the seals rub each other, and therefore we have got uh, various types of seals now. I understood, uh, I don't remember the names of the new seals. Yeah, carbon seals are there. Uh, they are using it. And if you find any improvement in the seal, you work on that, and that will be put on the engine. Uh, like that. If you try to work on uh, rotor dynamics of the engine, vibration analysis, uh, let us say um, uh, low cycle or high cycle fatigue, you work on that and prove something, then it will be implemented. So there are a lot of scopes to do research work in the engine, not as in the engine as a whole, but you have to take a small portion of the engine and then try to do some improvement in that. That is called innovation through research methodology and then put it to the design. That is how we do it. Now let us see how the engine is assembled, of course. And you see now, this is the same engine. I'm going to show the assembly, how it is done. Now this inlet casing, where it takes the, uh, the bearing for the HB compressor. Now HB compressor, sub-assembly this is, it's put there and the bearing gets into it. The, there there will be spline shaft and then intermediate uh, casing and you see the HB compressor spool and the HP shaft is there and there's the LP compressor shaft. It gets into that and there is a bearing for both the LP and HP compressor spools. You see the shaft, HP shaft there, combustion chamber there entering, assembled there and of course gearbox here and still the turbine stages have to come. There's a combustion chamber and you see the LP shaft and HP shaft and they have assembled the gearbox and the, which is required for fuel and um, oil supply and all that. Now HP turbine is overhanging, I think so. Then you can see here, the HV turbine is assembled HV um, spool or the shaft. Then comes the intermediate casing for the um, uh, turbine stages where you have the bearings. And then the LP turbine gets into it, gets attached. They're all splines. And then you have exhaust cone, we call, where the bearing for the LP turbine comes. Here is the bearing and he puts in. And then this afterburner and you find the V gutter and the afterburner where you burn more fuel and get high thrust, and this jet pipe we call, and that gets assembled. And then the variable area nozzle with the hydraulic jacks, you can see these hydraulic jacks here, it gets assembled there. So all these are the modular type. So one person can work on only one module. Even if you improve the V gutter angle, this, that, and all type uh, of V gutters, V radial, uh, what the circumferentially you want to enter a pen, uh, we got a here. if you make it the eight, and if you improve on that, you, you get a PhD, like that. And uh, of course, it's all sponsored research. Um, whether you get PhD or not, you get money. And now you see this, this oil tank there, and all this gearbox completely, and these are the trillion for mounting the engine on the aircraft. Uh, that is on the fighter aircraft. Now this is the HP compressor, the first rotor that you can see, uh, that's seen there. And then you have got these mounting units and you have got the oil tank for supply for the bearings. 
only you'll carry three three liters or four liters. That's all. That has to be sufficient. So you have to design the bearing system, bearing housing that uses only about um, three liters or four liters. Because the rule says uh, you should not consume. I mean, there will be oil leakage. Though we have air seal in the um, what you call chamber where we have the bearings, bearing housings chamber, we have seals by air. Air seals are there. But even then, we, uh, we can lose about half a liter per hour. So more than the consumption of fuel, sorry, oil, um, lubrication oil is more than half a liter per hour. The engine is not accepted. So these are some of the rules we have on rules and regulations. I'm just giving one or two examples because all these things I learned when I was in the aero engine factory. Remember, for to get into aero engine, the great man was Varghese Varghese, a Kerala person. We have to undergo six hours written test, three hours aptitude and three hours design in the banquet hall of Vidhan Sova. Now we can't enter Vidhan Sova at all. So three hours written test, um, IAM conducted it. That is on the aptitude test, uh, Indian uh, Institute of Management. And we had one hour lunch. And again, we started the design test. The one compulsory question was there. And uh, I think uh, four questions with some choice. And that six hours, uh, 200 people in Bangalore, 200 in Delhi. Out of 200, only 20 was subject, 10%. And out was again, um, what is that called? Interview was there. And 14 were selected, six were rejected. And I was one, by God's grace, I was one among them in the first batch management design training. So that is a rigorous way we had the entry to HL Air Engine Factory. And um, after all, afterwards, I left that Air Engine Factory. That's why I can tell you half a liter of uh, uh, oil is required for half an hour and one inch per second. All these things we study there, not um, in GTRE because there's an R&D establishment. There, if you have more than one inch also, we will tolerate and try to improve because we go for research more there. But in a factory, engine factory, we cannot undertake any research work there. You have to have a ready-made answer from the research which we can put on the design. That's why R&D, they are coupled together and our Girish Metaji uh, is heading that as a co um, uh, as, uh, as we as a as I can say, he is the co-dean because research and design, they are like brothers. Whatever research we do has to be put in the design after validation and verification. That's the thing. Now, we have to think of uh, some engine research areas. The design of the engine encompasses all faculty of engineering and science. Will not be aerodynamics, it has to be mechanical engineering. That boy has got mechanical engineering, a very vast one, vibration analysis. Then you have a stress analysis, so many damage tolerance design, so many things are there. And then you, it has a deco digital electron control system, therefore, it has got electronics and computer software, so many things. So, uh, engine design consists of people who are multidisciplinary in nature, as far as engineering knowledge is concerned. You cannot say, I don't know what is a, a diode, what is a pentode, or whatever it is. You should have some knowledge about that. And also, you should have mechanical knowledge. So many others, mechatronics have come into picture like that. And machine learning, something they are telling nowadays. I don't know what exactly it is. Now, what happens? What are the areas, trust areas uh, uh, for the research? For example, if it says thrust to weight ratio, usually the military engine will have thrust to weight ratio around. Uh, um, one, around one, means one kg of thrust um, per one kg of uh, the weight, I think. Some, uh, something for military engines, but for civil engines about 0.3 or so. Even if you improve in the second decimal, uh, the thrust to weight ratio uh, improve. And now we have thrust to weight ratio, I'm sorry, uh, for the military engine is around 10. I, I did a mistake in telling it. Thrust is 10 and weight, weight is 1. And now they are trying to improve to about 10 to 12, 12 to 15 like that. So that means you have to work on material science, try to have better material and uh, reduce the number of uh, uh, aerofiles in the turbine or in the compressor so that you reduce the weight. Overall, you have to start decreasing the weight. So uh, thrust to weight ratio 
we have to improve. That is going on. Air mass flow. And uh, why we have to worry about air mass flow is if you have specific thrust more in the engine with losses being minimum in all components, your uh, air mass flow, uh, you can choose a value, it will come out. If it is not, then to get the required thrust, you may have to increase the air mass flow. So again, that's a research aid. Engine geometry, engine mass, engine uh, mass means actually it's the weight, so to say weight of the engine that reduce. The CG, they also shift the CG here, there and all. Stall margins in the compressor, customer bleed you have to take, power takeoff for all accessories, and thrust vectoring. Nowadays they have thrust vectoring options. Earlier in NL, they were doing the propulsion division, uh, thrust vectoring by 2D, 3D. Um, uh, so many options they were doing it on lab level. I remember nowadays. Uh, NL, propulsion division, normally they do some experiments. Uh, actually, see, research is not only theoretical. In engineering, it has to be experimental. So, invariably, you have to do a lot of experiments. That means you should have uh, the required infrastructure or facility to do uh, uh, research in uh, the engine components, for example, combustion chamber. I remember I went to um, Surat uh, Engineering College where uh, I had to give some lecture for some of these turbo machinery and tech courses. And uh, there I found that uh, the, the professor uh, was working on combustion chamber. And therefore, he had some rigs, two, three rigs, where he was trying um, his uh, combustion experiments. So, invariably, when we think of research, it need not be on a computer sitting and working on equations and all that. It, has to, it can be on experimental scale. Because, for example, you want to improve the pressure loss in a combustion chamber, you do whatever calculations at home uh, in the office, but you have to try experimentally. You have to make that model, whatever uh, design, and test it experimentally and prove that uh, you measure the pressure inlet, measure the pressure outlet, and say the pressure is difference is so much. So that uh, thrust vectoring now, so many methods are there uh, to or have 2D, 3D, like that. That also can be done on a computer um, and then experiment it afterwards. Then integrated by engine performance at various altitudes and engine design life. I think uh, when I met uh, Greenfield University professor, he said he has got some three, four PhD students working on engine life, design life. So I was amazed, three, four PhDs he's guiding. Uh, he had come for one of the conference. I asked that professor, what is it you are doing? So he said, I got three, four PhD students working on engine life in Cranfield University, long back. Then maintenance logistics. See, I think now they have got new ideas about maintenance and logistics supports. New ideas. What we do in the engine, earlier, even now today, what we do, we make the engine, we test it about five uh, prototypes we test, five or six or whatever it is. Then we test one or two engines up to the end, till they break. I mean, till we find that the thrust uh, drops. Then it may be, say, 1,000 hours. Then we just multiply by a factor, let's say 0.5. So I will say about 0.6. So if I see no failure up to 1,000 hours, then I will declare the overall period, TBO. That means... Uh, the uh, what you call uh, we, we call that as uh, the the time between overalls TBO and uh, you overall in six, uh, 600 hours we'll say take out the engine even though it is in good condition what we say is uh, like or operation research uh, you have a topic there also replacement theory like that what we do is in in the case of war I have studied I find sometimes um, uh, it's funny. Um, now, if I say 1,000 hours is running without any problem, I declare 600 because I have to think of safety. So I will say 600 hours, you remove the engine and uh, strip the engine, take out all the seals, put new seals, and check uh, um, by various uh, methods uh, the turbine blades. You know, you have to have radiography test, so many tests are there. We do it to see whether any breakage, any crack is there because that may lead to failure. So you will think, okay, then we are someone, and again, go for um, testing after 600 hours. Maybe three overalls, we say throw it. 
So that way we are just having some improper logics for time between orals. But now there are PhDs, they say, why you want to do like that? There are logistic methods. Uh, let us say, it's an online correction. We can do, supposing the engine is misplaced slightly, then you are just online. Or it can be brought uh, to back and only without uh, dismantling it, you can repair. Some ideas they give. These are all some other things I think the professor uh, might, uh, might have been uh, guiding them. Uh, all are exponential and some theory also. So some logistic supports, they were doing it. Uninstalled dry thrust, that is in the lab we test it. And when it was put on the in, the in the fuselage, it may lose some power. So that is installed value. Uh, those uh, at sea level conditions uninstalled. And also when you install it at sea level conditions, you have checked what is the loss in the power. That also, you know, there is there's a limit. Um, there are some specified things and uh, it should not cross. By chance it crosses, you have to go for research. Why it is happening? Even finding out the fault in the engine, why it is behaving itself is research. And uh, then what are the major design requirements? The fan pressure ratio. Supposing I am having three-stage fan, giving only 3.5 pressure ratio. I ask you to make it four. So you have to throw out, you have to work three hours for three, three years and get me from 3.5 to four in three stages. That's a research program. Of course, research means not only in the 3D design using your CFD. Nowadays, commercial ports are there. CFX port is there. He's uh, used K Omega SST, turbulence model. Now they normally use K Omega model for the uh, K epsilon model for the combustion chamber and use K K Omega SST, uh, shear stress transport uh, turbulence model in the 3D RANS, U RANS, RANS code, and uh, then try to improve the profile of the um, blades and try to get a better, uh, in the same size, same diameter, same uh, uh, flow area, you have to get the uh, better performance. In the sense, you should set more mass flow, you should give them higher pressure ratio like that. And, so, and also overall pressure ratio gauge. So fan pressure ratio and overall pressure ratio, you have to optimize. And then HV compressor exit temperature. When the HV compressor exit temperature is very high, then we cannot use uh, the titanic, uh, titanium, but we may have to use steel there. So that also we have to see. Then the weight of the engine goes up. So we have to see the exit temperature of the, um, of the HV compressor, the GLP compressor of the HV compressor. So you have to think of using a titanium, some other material, but still weight you have to maintain. So turbine related temperatures for that, what type of material you are using, so power you are using. Nowadays we have so many methods of casting. We use cast alloys for the turbine. So equi cast is there, single crystal is there, and um, uh, linearly uh, solidification um, metal is there. So reheat temperature also you have to, they want to improve because you have to get about 60% of the temperature. Um, oh, it is already late. I'm sorry, I think I'm taking more time. So on that also we have to work in the engine control system, correct, full authority digital system, control system, and interfacing of the aircraft engine. There also you can do some work. And health monitoring, as I said, that you can do live targets, people are working in uh, train field and other universities because the uh, design house will not work on that. They'll give it to um, some of the engineering uh, or uh, industry uh, engineering colleges or uh, uh, some of the other uh, research centers where they can work on that and give the result. And of course, finally, reliability. How reliable a part is. That also has to be considered. Then the technologies, what you want, our uh, aerothermodynamics, you must really uh, expert in that. Thermal engineering, materials, manufacturing technology, must know. Structural design, water dynamics, systems and accessories, design, control system design, health, life monitoring systems, integration, testing, certification systems. In all these things, you have to have expertise and can do some work, research work on that. Take on materials, if you are good at materials. Take on manufacturing facilities and manufacturing technologies. Structural design damage control design, so many different things are coming. So what are advanced trends? I'll go faster. I think I'll consume more time. Um, 
So you can see how the size of the engine has come down over a period of time with a um, lot of R&D work and even aircraft, military aircraft, I'm talking military. So I'll go to the next. And you see the type of Trent engine, this Ion engine, which was used uh, uh, somewhere in 1950s. Now you can see the EJ200 here, what I shown. So small, test weight which is 10, and where is that was four. See the size of the engine. This has always come out because of research over a long period of time. Dedicated research. So this, this is the way. You want to reduce the weight of the engine, people work on that, on all components of it. You can see the overall pressure ratio. Earlier it is with 10. Now we go up to 25. This is a military engine. Advanced trends in the military engine, uh, especially on pressure issues. Then you see the temperatures of various aircrafts, various engines. F-100 engine, PG engine. Earlier in our uh, 1950s, we used to have turbine metal temperature, turbine gas temperature, for example, is about 800. Now it goes to 1800, 1500, 1600. That means different super alloys are used, different cooling techniques, thermal uh, engineering uh, design. They have done it and they have won over a period of time. In 2000, you can see uh, that one. I don't have data beyond that. So, and then thrust to weight ratio. Earlier it used to be four. Now thrust to, we get about 10 kg of thrust per 1 kg of engine. That is the level. And now it is going up to 12. So all these things are result of um, what you call the, um, the research, which has been done on component levels. Then some research areas I cover. For example, this is the HP compressor assembly. You can see the rotor. The stator is not shown. Should have higher centrifugality, high pressure ratio, good surge margin, minimum size and weight, and it should be flutter free. The blades should not have flutter. You should have a code. You, have to, you should develop a code. I think Germans have it. We are given to them. And they checked the flutter analysis of the blade. So flutter analysis have to be done and should be clear. And you can see the yellow peak compressor. How how highly twisted the output compressor is. So this will be vulnerable for the flutter. And if there is any flutter, we won't accept. So we'll have to see that. And HP compressor rotor assembly. You can see the number of stages, number of rotor blades used, and the airfoils that are used, all has to be optimized by research only. And we have variable status because um, the the rotor has to receive at various speeds, uh, various incidents, angle, inlet angle from the stator. So we have variable status and this variation is controlled by um, electronics. That's our digital electron control system and hydraulic jacks. So that also has to be studied. And when you make the compressor, you have so many things. When you operate, you should have surge margin, what we call a surge margin. Uh, like this, about 25%. Otherwise, the engine will search. One search means the reversal of the flow takes place. So that should be avoided. So when we operate and see on the compressor characteristics, if the operating line is not like this, if it goes nearer to search, the engine is not accepted. So we have to redesign the compressor and so on. You can see here, for example, the throttle line. When I'm pushing the throttle of the engine, you should go like this. You should not get into the search of the HP compressor or the LP compressor. Should be like this. We predict it, there are so many theories to predict, and you should follow that when we do the experiment. And we see on the monitor, if it doesn't follow that, the engine is brought back for some reason. Then we have to improve the engine. You can see the combustion chamber, which has got, uh, this is called annual combustion chamber with 18 burners, and uh, total pressure loss is minimum, high combustion efficiency, should be 99% combustion efficiency. You can't lose the fuel and minimum size and weight, and you should have proper temperature, travels quality at the exit, because that uh, will affect the turbine life. So that also you have to see. You can see we do thermal index paint, and after running 100 hours, we check from this thermal index paint. This is another experiment. Now we see what are the temperatures on the liner, where hot zones are there, where cold zones are there, so that we check. And you see the turbine, the HP turbine, uh, the disc itself is about 90 kg. Each blade is about 100, 100, 100 grams or 150 grams. This is about 160 grams. This may be about 100 grams. Uh, so you have a huge, uh, high, high, heavy disc. Of course, if a super alloy, it may be, um, we have so many different alloys, uh, super alloys, and uh, so many different materials are used there. 
and you can see the young peer players are longer. They should not get into resonance. You have to study that before doing anything. After the RFL design, this resonance should be checked uh, by some of the ports what we have. So high, high efficiency, high power output per stage and minimum size, minimum weight and should be free from resonance in the operating condition. Especially LP, not the HP. HP is very short, but the LP blades are longer and the natural frequency may just get matched with any of the natural frequency of the combustion, instability or whatever it is, then it will start resonating in peak. So those things we have to check. And you see the configuration, they're all cast blades. You can see how the HP turbine blades, leading edge cooling is done, showered cooling, passages you have to provide, otherwise this is a cast blade and it's a hollow blade. The gas temperature will be 18, 16, 150, but metal temperature will be 1000. That means to that extent, matter has to be cooled by internal cooling passages. It's a very complicated, um, this is a and that's a root, a very complicated internal design and thermal analysis. A lot of people have done PhD. They are in IIT Kanpur and other places they have done it, as I've seen. And you can see internal presses, you have got uh, inserts like this to meter the flow on the leading edge side and on the training edge side. And then we have pins here, which can take up uh, cooling effect uh, when the air passes, when the cooling air from the compressor cooling. Compressor air itself is hot, but cool. Compared to turbine uh, inlet temperature, they are cool only. So they are passed in this uh, um, stator, especially that is the one which faces the combustion chamber. So we have two inserts, one insert to cool the trailing edge side, that is this side, and one insert to have the uh, shower head cooling, the leading edge, because that faces the combustion chamber. For the rotor, we have multi-pass cooling, some people have studied already uh, the cooling uh, configuration. They have taken PhDs. So, of course, you have to do it on a lapse level, or you take one blade and make a perspex model and push water or some other uh, way of doing it. Uh, there are so many ways of uh, doing experiments. And now, coming to the manufacturing side, we have three types of uh, blades. Uh, one is uncooled, you just cast as it is. And this is a cooled blade with a serpentine path. One for the leading edge and one for the trailing edge. Multiple pass cooling, and then we have what is known as thermal barrier coating. So these are the things. So this is uncooled. Then we have multi-pass cooling inside. Over and above that, you do what is known as thermal barrier coating. You want to get an improvement. You can see this is 1425 degrees centigrade. Now you add 300 for that, or two to to 78. So you see 1550 C it faces, whereas this only 1425. So this add, let's say, 300. 18, 1800 or 1850, it can take the top temperature, T3. Whereas this will not take, and you see this one. This can take about 1100, that's all. So an uh, engine which is designed for 1100, you don't have to cool. You just forge the blade. Forging is do. But here this is cast with multiple passes. And here, after that also, you are having a thermal barrier coating. So these are all different techniques that are adopted. And all are experimentally verified by research technologies. And then we use nowadays extremely uh, popular um, codes are there, commercial code, CFX code, Numeca code for compressor, fan, and then answer code and fluid code for combustion. And turbine use CFX and Numeca code also, because Numeca is conjugate heat transfer, we can do on that. Then we use fluent code, star CD for this uh, Afterburner system and uh, this one. So there are different codes. So all codes are available. And at college level, you must learn. Um, I hope uh, they will give uh, um, a reduced type of uh, uh, freely. They may give it they, because it will cost in course so that the students can learn how to use pre-processing and um, what for grid generation and then pre-processing, post-processing, applying boundary condition. All these things you learn and become good engineers and that will help you want to do research activity. So uh, mostly now people depend on uh, the uh, what you call computer codes, which are commercially available. And at college level, you, I think the professors must give you uh, some more chance for people to learn using these codes. Some of them get college level free, some of the things with a limited so this knowledge. And you can see the combustion chamber, how it has been designed, and you can see the hot zone there, and uh, the where this is called the primary zone, this is primary zone, secondary zone. This is some cold flow analysis, it's a hot flow analysis to understand the efficiency and the pattern factor, 
uh, what you call the temperature trans quality to improve the size of the combustion chamber, weight of the combustion chamber, the pressure loss in the combustion chamber, all these things can be done by CFD studies. And this turbine, we use uh, RANS code, we generate uh, the grid and power and then use RANS code, U-RANS code, 3D CFD codes are extremely useful and you can see the pattern of the pressure, temperature, entropy, and we, after doing the analysis, applying proper boundary condition, we can see how the, uh, the losses are taking place, uh, choking and non-choking areas and pressure, temperature, uh, velocities, and we can have confidence and all that. And then we can improve upon that. So when you come to rotor dynamics, as I said, the engine order we will say that is about, uh, let's say 40,000 units in engine order, five times that. And the frequency you calculate, and the blade frequency if it somewhere in the operating range matches with the, um, the blade frequency, matches with the engine speed within the uh, operating range, then it will get into resonance. That is studying the camper diagram. So some of the people can work on camper diagram, what is camper diagram, how to study that, take some examples and do some small at least project work and you understand. Supposing there is inevitably now, of course, we have when, when there is a resonating, then we have what is known as shroud there. We provide a shroud for a longer bit. In addition to that, we provide what is known as damper to have the longitudinal and lateral, uh, what you call vibration to avoid that. We provide some dampers here. And also, we provide what is known as the shrouds for the blade. But if you put the shroud, that means you are putting material at the top, and therefore the blade stresses go up at the root. So, one has to be very careful to design the shroud. That itself is a technology we have to work on that. And like that, for example, you see this unshrouded and this shrouded blade. This was resonating. Therefore, in, in the LP turbine, the engine, they made a shroud and properly placed the shroud so that it can take the stresses. And here, this is for tree root to fix the blade to the disc. These are all for tree roots that also are designed properly. Some areas are there. And then we have Goodman's diagram particularly for vibration. So you, this is the tolerable, this is the tolerable alternating stress, this is tolerable um, steady stress and draw on this. And when you study experimentally, your values of the stresses in the blade should be here, not crossing that. So this is called Goodman's diagram. You also, I think it will be taught in the colleges in your study and it comes to afterburner. That also you have got, um, um, no, no, back. Now, uh, what happens, you see, I think I have to go back. Yeah, so you can see the afterburner is on, let us say, and uh, we have the V gutters. Can you see these V gutters? And if I press it, I must study, see, see if you study how the temperature, when you burn the fuel there, if you burn the fuel and we see the temperature distribution, how it is coming. You know, see if it's not completely, it is burnt and the temperature distribution is such that screech won't come. Otherwise, screech, there's another technology. A lot of work has been done on screech. You can study that also. And we study the temperature distribution because it should be uniform as far as possible and uh, spread all over this one. So we have to do these laws, temperature plots using CFD ports, uh, conjugate heat transfer ports. And then the variable uh, nozzle, when you put on the heat, the nozzle should open. And in the drain mode, it should come back. So afterwards, when you put on the reheat, immediately the, the throat uh, area of this nozzle should change. And especially this requirement of thrust for clean. Now, all Russian engines, big uh, engines, they have variable um, no area nozzles and also swelling nozzles to have the thrust uh, thrust opening option. So you can see all these things, you see hydraulic jacks are there. And in the case of swelling, swelling, the throat area should not change. That also, they have a method, another hydraulic jacks somewhere. We can study some of those things. Uh, you may have to visit HL factories and uh, maybe um, uh, whether it is uh, possible for you to uh, see those things in HL, um, whichever establishment you can do. I think I have I think I may have to conclude quickly and you see the engine on the test bed. We have a bell mode to measure the mass flow and uh, we have a floating bed to measure the thrust and the heat is all on that. So we do that. 
for the uh, advanced CFD studies they make, especially through flow, they can make. Um, you can see here. Yes. This is done by Russians. I got it from them. And so, how the temperature, pressure, there is in the whole of the engine. They have done it. They have taken about three years. I believe three students, PhD students, work on that. This is the full engine analysis. They have done it. Three research students uh, with a professor, I think they have done it. Uh, so, this is a full study. Uh, you know, they have done it. And these are also the cooling techniques of the blade, particularly the turbine blade. And so, materials manufacturing. You can see earlier, we are used to fixing the compressor blade, turbine blade by Dauté. Now it is become brisk and blink. The disk also is removed. You can see the weight reduction, conventional, and this brisk. That means blade is together with the disk. And here, blink, when the disk is removed, it's like a ring, some of that. So that way, you can even reduce the, and some of these uh, silicon carbide uh, reinforced materials, they are using it. And advanced uh, product, uh, laser painting and other um, new methods they have manufacturing things. And nowadays they are thinking of clean technology, the emission they want to reduce it from the engine. That's for the civil engines. Enabling the technologies by 2020, they have done already 2020 has come beyond seven, Boeing 787, seven, they want to have lower energy uh, emission. That also they are working on that. Clean technology. Rolls Royce is working on clean technology for civil engines. All our research areas. You can take up some small topic, how to reduce the uh, NOx emission uh, by means of uh, altering the combustion chamber or something like that. And then finally, versatile, affordable, advanced turbine engines. I think these Americans are trying. This is called light changing. Versatile, affordable, advanced turbine engines that are adaptive versatile technology there. And, and you can see to avoid the uh, air signature, they are deflecting it so that uh, they won't directly go. That also they do. So uh, again, health monitoring, instead of having uh, the overall between some interval of time, they want to have health monitoring online itself. So that you can decide small, small corrections can be done online when the engine is still there. Uh, so many research work has been done. Thus, the innovations and plants and gas turbine job continue even today to meet the challenges of next generation. More and more, they want people. The quiet engine they want, cleaner engine they want, higher efficiency they want. Keep on asking more and more. So that can come only by research and analysis and, of course, experimentation. So thank you all for having taken your patience to listen to me. I hope I have covered in a simple way. There are many other areas uh, apart from what I have said for research activities in the gastronomic technology. Thank you all. So I have taken about 15 minutes more. I apologize for that. No problem, sir. Yes. Now we request the audience to add their doubts and questions in the chat box. Okay, good. So I can answer. Uh, any question, please. If I am possible, if it is possible, I'll answer. Yes, sir. There is one. Huh. So uh, it is asked that what is the role of Industry 4.0 in turbine engine? Uh, uh, excuse me once again. The question: What is the role of the Industry 4.0 in turbine engine. Four, uh, industry 4.0 in turbine What is that 4.0? I didn't understand. Sir, uh, uh, sir actually, 4.0 uh, means uh, this IoT based tools in uh, turbine design and uh, operation actually. Now, uh, this is engine you are talking or only turbine module you are thinking? No, no, turbine engine, sir, as a assembly, complete assembly. Ah, complete uh, engine, yeah. yeah. What is it you are expecting from the engine? Engine has got the features like the two weight ratio or SFCs, specific fuel consumption. Mm -hmm. These two are the things that they will ask. What is it you are asking? Please tell me. No, sir, actually, uh, about the preventive and health window, like that, for monitoring the performance. Yeah, yeah, preventive other, yeah, yeah. health monitoring this thing. Yeah, what we do is actually we have a deco, digital yes. electron control yes, yes. system there. And um, yes. we have, uh, we will be having some new neurons in that. 
and uh, we can we can put some of the what you call artificial intelligence in that. Yes, yes. Okay. And uh, you have to train that. That has to be done at lab level, not there. And take the engine and try to make. Uh, supposing you have a temperature uh, increased, I say fifteen hundred degrees, and it goes to fifteen ten. Finished. It will give a signal there, and try to uh, make the fuel uh, reduce, reduce the fuel, the throttle level, and the throttle level, and vibration. Supposing it has gone more than one inch per second, immediately it will give a, a signal that the vibration has gone up. So the, basically, we have problem in vibration and. Uh, the temperature, top temperature levels, and this can be monitored and put it to a, a artificial intelligence system, and that will tell online. So the pilot can take some of the things we train uh, that a pilot can do online. Otherwise, it has to come back to the base. Okay. Okay, so still, they are working on it. A lot of work is going on with that. A lot of work is going on and putting in artificial intelligence in the aircraft uh, about the engine to monitor its uh, health. Health monitoring systems are there. A lot of uh, things are there. I think I can't go deep into it. So we put in health monitoring system on the engine and some can be there itself corrected. Some of them not they cannot be corrected. The engine is the aircraft comes back. The pilot will be more monitored. Okay, is okay. that clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, uh, no AI has come into picture. Artificial intelligence. Uh, anything more? So there is one more question. Yeah. Uh, can the HP turbine withstand or maintain its thermal stability during supersonic phase? Yes, a supersonic speed of the aircraft. That is concerned with the aircraft. Our engine can easily. It's a, the engine when it is running at the design point. The HP runs at that speed at that top temperature, and more than the turbine is the compressor. You should not go to the search. So you see that at design point, either at the lab level, we'll have 25% search margin at the design point of compressor. And HP turbine, let it be HP or LP turbine, whatever it is, it will be performing its duty. Whatever the, it has got the temp top temperature, we don't measure. We measure the jet pipe temperature. The top temperature you can't put in front of the turbine a thermocouple. If by chance the thermocouple fails, the engine is gone. It will break all the plates. So we have jet pipe temperature. Jet pipe temperature, we have a relation with respect to the top temperature of the engine. So if the jet pipe temperature goes up, let's say 600, even while testing, if it is 610, the engine is brought back. Even at testing level, they are very rigid. We can't take chances. So uh, we have like sensors, the, especially uh, the vibration sensors and the jet pipe uh, sensor that will tell the health of the engine any, any time. These two are enough for the time. Anything more? Yes, sir. There is one more question. Mm. How does the ramjet amplify the performance of an aircraft? Uh, what is the question? Ramjet. How does the ramjet uh, amplify the performance of an aircraft? Uh, I am not catching what is that lamb range. What is exactly the meaning of that? I am not getting that word, I think. Uh, uh, sorry, okay. sir. Yeah. Can we... Uh, sir, I asked this, that question. Sir, no. uh, ramjet is an... Uh, ramjet, huh? Yeah, yeah, sir. Oh, you are asking ramjet. Yes, sir. Yes. How does that uh, amplify the performance of an aircraft? No, ramjet... You see, we don't use in an aircraft because uh, it has no compressor, there's no turbine. Okay. And it, it has no compressor, there's no turbine. What we do is, there is just like a, um, a duct there where when it sucks the air and then we put the fuel there and there's a nozzle and it takes care of it. And uh, this ram, due to ram, that means it works only when the aircraft is having supersonic speed, say, Mac. 1.8 or 2. Because ram air has to enter. That's why ramjet. There's no problem. Uh, sir, uh, US Air Force uh, has made a, made an aircraft called uh, SR-71 Blackbird. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, which uses this uh, uh, ramjet. Ah, that ramjet will take over when the aircraft goes more than Mach 2. Because ram air is compressed here. Due to ram compression, 
see when you put a ram uh, ram jet we call uh, when the because of the shock there in the image there is a shock therefore static pressure rises okay the total pressure might drop but then you get a static high pressure there and you put uh, what you call the um, the fuel there it burns there in the duct itself and there is a nozzle and uh, it expands and gets it so there is no turbine there is no compressor but it works only in the supersonic zone so you have to carry it carry the aircraft to the supersonic zone and then switch on this ram up to that you have to use gas turbine or any other thing maybe rocket so what they do is they fly with the rocket and after certain uh, altitude and speed they switch on to the ram jet ram jet doesn't work without uh, uh, ram air that means mac 2 plus normally i say mac 2 plus thank you sir that is the uh, speed of the aircraft should be mac 2 Mark two. Then there will be ram air into the ram jet and put the fuel there. Immediately it produces the power, power, power jet. So it has to be assisted up to that extent in as we fly to get that Mark two there. It is designed to Mark two. Mark two point five. Mark two. You can design as you like. And even testing in the laboratory, you have to have uh, a flow in in that uh, uh, model where you are keeping Mark two. That means the wind tunnel must give supersonic wind tunnel only you can test it. And then wind tunnel can't test the ram jet at all. That's why it is. So But there is one more question here. Uh, is it efficient to use planetary gear mechanism in turbofan engine in between engine fan shaft link uh, for subsonic planes? Actually, this is uh, innovative design. You are asking. Um, Planetary gear box is it? That's what you are asking. Correct. Yes, sir. Yeah. Now you see in the engine itself, Pratt and Whitney is doing now. I think I showed on slide, but I didn't want to elaborate on that. What we do, I will tell you. There is a big fan. I told you the pressure ratio. Uh, sorry, the bypass ratio is eight. Suppose you are sucking eight hundred kg of air. The fan. Imagine what I power I should give to that. Uh, you know, what is it called? Uh, that fan. And the fan has to fan will have a tall blade, something like uh, the diameter is ten feet. I can walk into it. That means the blade can be even five feet, uh, say three feet, three feet. Then the tip mark number, relative mark number, tip relative mark number should not exceed one point two or one point three. So that means the speed has to be low. When I make the speed of the compressor low, the driver, the HP turbine, U into delta V theta is the power in the uh, in the turbine. You into the tangential momentum. That's what. Then uh, I should have a number of stages of uh, turbine. That's power turbine to drive that big fellow because he's sucking more mass flow and a big diameter. And then what we do? Pattern you need in between. They have a planetary gear box there. They are drawing that to reduce the speed of the fan. At the same time, increase the speed of the turbine so that I can reduce the number of stages of the turbine and. Oh, that's they are doing. And now what happened? We use a gear train. I'll tell you what happened when my friend was doing for the helicopter because my colleague uh, was doing it. We are all from NIA College, mechanical engineers. And uh, for the planetary gear box of the helicopter, the Semilac system said, "Run it for 100 hours. Let us see whether the planetary gear box works or not." 98 hour it failed. So this patent with me now because it's a civil engine. And what they are doing, they are testing the gearbox, which is between uh, in the between the HP compressor and the fan. I mean, the LP compressor, if you call it the fan, whatever you call. It. And there, there is a gearbox. The planetary gearbox is there, and um, that has to be tested to at least three times the safety. Now, if I say 100 hours, you are tested for through it. It's reliability for 300 hours. I feel like that. Some three times you have to prove that it is not failing at all. Then only, so they are doing a lot of tests on that, and that 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 way they are reducing the number of stages of yield. The power turbine or yield meter they are reducing the not power. We can call it as yield meter turbine. They are reducing the number of stages by having a gear box in the intermediate casing, which drives the fan and the yield meter turbine. Yield meter turbine, there is no problem. Uh, that's how it is. You can use the gear box, but it requires a thorough, thorough. Um, um, Experimental validation of its life and reliability. Otherwise, uh, you will have uh, safety is 
they will take a back seat. Ah, that is the way. You can use plant gearbox, but you know what happens? I'll tell you how in our two engine when French people when we were doing HL, we were failing, and what that uh, mechanic came from there. I, I remember I was there. We have so many small small gears for the helicopter uh, engine. He said, make all the gears twelve number. So we put let's say five gears, all twelve numbers have been made. That mechanic looked at it and chose one in each, and uh, he said, "You assemble now. You run." He said, "Stand no perfectly all right. There is no problem." Then we were asking, "Sir, what happened? Learn to respect my drawing." That's all the word he used in French. Learn to respect my drawing. Everything is all. That means the tolerance, hardness, very important. He said, "I mean, be frank. That is, if one gear is hard. Oh, no problem. It's very hard, enough. Huh? Hardness increase more can be better, is it not? That fellow will crane the other fellow because he is that may be having some hardness, build hardness, say X, and he is having just X plus delta X more. That fellow will start rubbing that fellow. So hardness must be more or less equal within the limits. You cannot uh, think, oh, this is very good or no. Therefore, what happens if you use a planted gear box? All gears must be touch, uh, tested thoroughly. Uh, for inspected thoroughly and reliability engineering has to be practiced there you if it is not within the limits of the tolerance you better throw get another one this experience we have in our two stage long back and talking about 40 years back the french people they told that one mechanic to learn to respect the drawing they would have done a lot of work on that that's how it is so we cannot compromise on quality of the aero engine component you have to even nut bolt or a washer you have to maintain the quality whatever is given to try you can you can compromise then will be in trouble it's a very complicated uh, system you know, can't take is it okay Anything yes no? ah. i guess there are no more things now Mm. Um, let's move further. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for enlightening us with your kind words of wisdom and for being an ideal example of inspiration and motivation. I guess there is one more question. Yeah. Uh, what are the factors to be considered during designing of a HP turbine for a submarine? For a sub, you see, uh, HP turbine for a submarine, whether it is submarine, aircraft, or anything, HP turbine drives the HP compressor. Fine, okay. And the HP turbine has two parameters: one is the inlet pressure and inlet temperature. And uh, let us not worry about pressure, but particular temperature. And uh, for that particular temperature, you must use proper material. Super oil, it has used. It has used, and the blade drawing when we do for the HP turbine, four people have to assign that. Number one, aerodynamics man, because you make the uh, blade uh, profiles. Number two, the material man, he has to select the proper material depending on the temperature, and the third one is mechanical engineer. Of course, he doesn't get into resonance. It's a short blade. HP turbines are very short because high pressure and high temperature is coming. And therefore, it's a short blade. I don't think there's any problem. But vibration studies have to be made. Critical speed has to be made for the disc. And that is mechanical engineering. It should be perfect. Then manufacturing man comes into picture. So manufacturing man, material man, aerodynamics man, and uh, mechan mechanics. All the four people have to match the study and put their signature. And um, then only we'll go for manufacturing. Then these are the conditions they have taken into consideration. Of course, disc study we make, not only blade, disc study also we make. Then um, normally, you know, it uh, calls for a very high expenditure, something like three years, some 10 crores for one set, 10 to 15 crores. And that's the less now, I'm telling old, it can be one more in dollars. You have to give. It's not done here. Normally, we used to get it in Israel also. And anybody for that matter, we can go to England, France, they are not here in India. We don't make HP turbine blades or discs in India. We don't. We get it from abroad. 
So because uh, the temperature and uh, the super alloys, uh, we have to go abroad. And some coatings are there for that. Even that also we go abroad. Machining, we have to go abroad. Casting, we have to go abroad. Of course, DMRL nowadays are trying for it. In fact, uh, I should not tell. Once in one of the interview boards, uh, I asked them because for the investment casting, there are three, three types of investment casting: one e-cast and, of course, single crystal blade, where there is no crystal uh, in the boundaries. We may that's very costly. One is five rupees, and uh, so e-cast is only one rupee. That's five times the cost. So where there is no these grain boundaries at high temperature, they are weak. Therefore, what we do is column structure we make. That is where the load is coming. Along that, you can make the um, uh, grain boundaries so that uh, it won't uh, be crossing that. That is uh, column structure. That cooling technique you have to adopt for that. The other one is single crystal. You grow only one embryo to become uh, the blade. That means that you don't have grain boundary at all. And that can have very high temperature strength. A high temperature strength, and it can withstand high temperature. And um, that costs more. The single crystal blades, we get it abroad now. I think we are trying to use it, but very, very costly. Yes. Still, uh, we are not uh, doing a gamma red single crystal blade. Calm structure, they are making it. It requires a furnace itself. Uh, I don't know where uh, HL Korapath might have bought it for uh, the Russian engines. They would have gone the furnace and all. It will cost several crores, several crores. They do it. Furnace is important first. Uh, then the technology to grow one embryo uh, into a blade. That means uh, there is a way of doing it. Mm, that is the technology. So I think Russian engines, they are using it in HL for uh, You have to take Mehta uh, Chisa, you are the students to somehow go to Mm, HL for offer. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, so take them and see the uh, various uh, um, um, methodologies of turbine, compressor, what they do, manufacturing facilities. They will do it if you contact the general manager. And okay. Them, uh, you can do for senior mechanical engineering and even aero seniors. You can take them and they get very good exposure for all these things. What uh, questions uh, you raised? Uh, okay, but in infrastructure, you can see that. So, that's a, it's a tough technology. Engineering uh, yeah, is very tough as far as the engine is concerned. Uh, it's very easy. Yeah. Okay, Amiya. Yes, sir. Uh, 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 thank you so much, sir, for enlightening us with your kind words of wisdom and for being an ideal example yeah. of inspiration and motivation for all of us. It was a pleasure hearing from you. Uh, the feedback link is shared in the chat box below. Uh, do share your valuable suggestions with us. I thank you all for your constant attention and full enthusiasm for today's event. You guys added a great glory to our function. We hope we get your support and participation on second and third day as well. We are having some great topics delivered by proficient speakers ahead. We are having three sessions tomorrow starting at 11 a.m. So stay ready to get indulged in the pulse of wisdom. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to mention here, uh, Dr. Thandaga sir, thank you very much uh, for accepting our uh, invitation in short uh, notice period and uh, it is wonderful session you have given and uh, certainly I hope uh, by your uh, knowledge uh, the uh, research students they will elevate uh, further research uh, areas uh, what they want to do the research in. And experience and success. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, now you can end the meeting, and as well as uh, YouTube live, it should be end now.
Thank you so much for all joining and we will meet tomorrow at 11 a.m. Bye-bye. Yes. Thank you, sir.